Audiobook title, Reincarnated as an FPS Player, 01-19, by Immortal Emperor. Volume 1, Prologue. I, Kuramoto Haruto, had been leading the same everyday life in high school as always. Good morning. Oh, he's here. Hey, that guy is here. Uck, there's an attacker here. Gross. Yes, this is the everyday life that hasn't changed for me. Why am I like this? Well, I have two otaku tendencies, I'm a fan of both idols and anime. These otaku hobbies became a source of repulsion for the normies, leading to mockery, gossip, and exclusion. And then, a while ago, they picked a fight with me. They didn't like it when I told them to stop making fun of me. So they attacked me while clicking their tongues. However, since I had learned gun handling and combat from my mentor, who was part of the Thai Navy Special Forces, I fought back and things turned out this way. That guy is reading light novels again in the morning. He's a real otaku. Seriously? Wouldn't it be better if that guy just died? Agreed. I wish he would just die. I understand that feeling. Ugh. They're saying it as if they want me to hear. They stopped physically bothering me after I gave them a taste of their own medicine, but I wonder if they're not embarrassed to talk like this? Isn't this what they call the howling of a loser? Moreover, everyone else is saying the same things as them. Just how much? Good day, Mr. Kuramoto. I wonder why you're here. You're quite a nuisance. Would you kindly disappear from here? There she is, the rich girl, Inos Masumi. She was born into a famous wealthy family but failed the entrance exams for the prestigious comprehensive school twice and ended up like this. Now, she's been abandoned by her parents or something. Shall I explain it in simpler terms? What are you talking about? Let me say one thing to this foolish rich girl. Why don't you transfer to that comprehensive school after summer break? Well, whether you pass or not is up to you. GRR. She's glaring at me with furrowed brows and grinding her teeth. She really has a short fuse. And high school is a place you attend of your own free will. Whether I go or not is my decision. Besides, this isn't your company, is it? Are you in a position to tell me to quit? If you keep doing this, you'll get dissed in some magazine again won't you? Are you doing this intentionally? In that case, there's no other word for you but fool. Indeed, my recent expose in the newspaper about what she's been up to at this school, or rather, the scandals she's been involved in, resulted in social consequences. However, she hasn't learned her lesson and remains unapologetic, even openly defying me. She left without apologizing still acting as if she did nothing wrong. Sigh. Why are you sighing? Well, your parents are having a hard time, I thought. Huh? What are you talking about? I thought of explaining it to her, but just then, the school bell rang. All right, everyone, take your seats. I'm taking attendance. Onomoto Hisa, our completely useless homeroom teacher. Why is he useless? Because he knows about the bullying happening in his class and does nothing about it. Yes. He knows but turns a blind eye, thinking he can ignore it as long as he doesn't become a victim. Everyone's in their seats. Now, what? What is this? As the teacher raised his eyes, he let out an astonished cry, and I looked up to see a mysterious image, like a picture with countless characters written inside a large circle, projected on the ceiling. Projection mapping? No, that's not it. There's no way this clear of projection mapping would appear in the classroom's brightness. Then, what is that? What is this? What on earth? Could this be? Another worldly transfer? Huh? Damn it. The door won't open. Yes, somehow, a magic circle had been drawn on the ceiling. Huh? No way. Seriously? Are we going to be transferred to another world with these guys? No. 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 I'd rather be alone than with these guys. In fact, I'd be fine with just reading light novels for otherworldly experiences, since the door and windows don't seem to be opening, um, I guess I'll try to hang onto the blackboard's ledge to avoid the otherworldly transfer, can I even avoid it? Hey, don't push, come on, open it already, you guys heard me say the door won't open earlier, right? I'll open it, so move, I'm going to become a hero and save the world. I'm going to make my dream harem a reality. There's one person who stands out, but I'll ignore that for now. That person must be one of the same kind. As we were all fussing about, the light grew stronger, and when it reached the point where I couldn't open my eyes, 
I lost consciousness. Ha, huh, where is this? This is the heavenly realm, where God resides. The boy in front of me spoke while looking at me. It was too sudden, and honestly, it scared me. Maybe this kid is God. Then, he'll probably give me some special powers and that'll be it. Oh, I thought I'd say, I want you to become a hero and save the world, but your situation is a bit different. What do you mean? And are you not reading my thoughts? Because you're God? It seems like you don't understand your current situation. Current situation? Come to think of it. My body feels light, and it's like I'm floating. Do I have a fever? It's not that. You see, you have died. Huh? What are you talking about? I'm alive and well. I tried to place my hand on my chest, but I didn't feel anything. In fact, I couldn't even feel the sensation of moving my arm. You finally realized. Yes, you died because of a failed transfer. What? No way E. 42. Prologue 2. How are you feeling now? Yes, I've calmed down. But, why did this happen? When we attempted to transfer the entire class, including you, to another world, only you failed. Failed? Was there some issue? The god covered his mouth, appearing on the verge of laughter, and began explaining. Ha ha. Well, you see, the reason was. It had to do with where you were standing. Your position happened to be right on the border of the magical circle's effective range. Furthermore, your clinging to the edge of the blackboard interfered with the transfer. While we anticipated students clinging to doors and desks, this was an unexpected circumstance and not integrated into the magic circle's program. I see. I understand now. Great. I've finally explained it. Your body was transferred, but it seems that your soul remained in your original world. That my adventure in another world would end before it even began. What an awful bad ending. But, be careful. I can hear your thoughts in your current state. Really? Yes. Your body is missing, so your thoughts are clear to me. But let's get to the main point. We don't have much time. The god produced a crystal from thin air and displayed an unfamiliar continent within it. To elaborate on the previous situation, you were supposed to transfer to this continent in Galas, which is on the northern part of our world, along with your classmates. However, due to your actions, it didn't work out. Ah, I see. My actions were quite foolish. The god sighed but realized that she didn't grasp the gravity of the situation, so she decided to explain further. Anyway, you failed, and there's no way to return to your previous world. So, I'm thinking of reincarnating you closer to where your classmates are. How do you feel about that? Do you want to be close to your classmates? No, I refuse. Ah, I thought so. It seemed that the god understood my reluctance, or perhaps she had investigated it. You don't want to meet them, do you? Your relationship with your classmates wasn't great. Indeed, as the gods said, I didn't get along with my classmates. If anything, I'd prefer going to the depths of hell over being in the same world as them. Besides, I'm not into RPGs. I'm more of an FPS gamer. I understand your feelings. And, I have a personal request. While we have a hero, I still hope you can save this world, with a hero around things should be fine, but, I wondered if they were truly fit to be heroes, is there a hero's destiny, or, could it be that the others won't want to see me, I don't know for sure, but I believe so, all right, please do it, but, about the location, do I need to go where my classmates are, it's the same world, but the place of your reincarnation will be different. Traveling from where you'll be reincarnated to where your classmates are will take about four to five months so it won't be easy to meet. Having my favorite guns and vehicles was appealing. Meeting my classmates. Well, I doubted they would want to see me anyway. I was starting to feel excited about going to another world. Please, reincarnate me as an FPS player, not in rebounds per game player. Very well, then. Let me explain a few things before the reincarnation begins. Okay, first, I'll prepare a body for you in the same shape as your previous one along with your Vmo data. Once everything is ready, I'll just need to incorporate your soul into the body. But there's one issue. An issue? Yes. You won't be able to use magic at all. And you won't be a hero. Magic won't work? Is it because there's no magic or heroes in that world like in the game? Exactly. 
but there are some advantages to it. Status effects from magic won't affect you, paralysis, curses, no matter how powerful, won't work. But, be cautious, offensive magic can still harm you. I understand, I'll be careful. I'll explain the rest after your reincarnation. Now, are you ready? Yes. All right. Let the reincarnation begin. After the God's words, I started feeling drowsy, just before losing consciousness. I heard her say, do your best. God's perspective. Phew. It's finally over. I was really nervous. I never expected the transfer to fail in such a way. I'll need to review the magic circle. Next time, I should make sure it can work even if someone clings to the blackboard. Huh? Um, Lord Gailers. Has his reincarnation finished? She was the goddess Smelta Inas, responsible for causing this incident. Well, I kept it from her to ensure everything went smoothly. It's done. By the way, didn't I tell you before? The effectiveness of the transfer magic circle doesn't increase with more magic power. Yes, I'm sorry. While she appeared remorseful, she didn't seem to grasp the gravity of the situation, so I continued to explain. You see, in this case, well, he was on the brink of complete annihilation because he couldn't cross into the new world. If I hadn't noticed and intervened, the entire school building might have been teleported to an existing castle, or all of the students, including him, might have had their souls completely erased by his magic power. Her face turned pale. She realized the gravity of the mistake she was about to commit. From now on, please be more careful. Now, back to work. Yes, I understand. She returned to her workspace with a dejected look. This time, things ended relatively smoothly. I remember another incident when another goddess mistakenly caused the death of someone. She demanded abilities on par with ours, full access to all skills, and a vast sum of money in the new world. Well, she passed, away long ago, and she ended her second life rather uneventfully. He he, he seemed interesting. He was so absorbed in his thoughts that he forgot they were transparent. Well, it's about time he arrived. Wait. What's this? Something was strange. Why did this happen? Oh, could he be mad at me? At that moment, the god realized her own mistake. But it was too late to turn back now. 43. Chapter 1. Side of Haruto Kuramoto. <coughs> Ark. Where am I? Oh, right. I remember now. I was reincarnated by a god. And I was sleeping against this tree. Wasn't I? As I sat up, I looked around. There was a vast grassy plain mountains in the distance, and the air was incredibly clear, soothing my mood more than anything. Wow, so this is another world? I'm actually looking forward to this. Huh? Wait, my voice sounded strange. Wasn't my voice deeper than this? It felt like I had heard this voice somewhere before. I put my hand on my throat and attempted to speak again. N N R R R. Huh? It was definitely strange. I couldn't have suddenly developed a high-pitched voice like this, and, wow, what lovely hands. Wait a minute. When I lowered my gaze, there were ample breasts in front of me. Moreover, the hair reflected in my eyes was not black but straight and white. I ran my hand through my hair, confirming that it reached down to my waist. It was silky smooth and felt great. And finally, I placed my hand between my legs to check, and as I expected, the male anatomy that should have been there was missing. It's gone. No, 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 no. This appearance, it's the avatar from that FPS game I used to play, right? Why do I look like this? Amidst my turmoil, a screen suddenly appeared in front of me. It was one of the convenient features from that game. A video chat. Hey there, Haruto Kuramoto. It seems like you've successfully reincarnated. Do you feel any discomfort or anything unusual? Ahaha. I gave the god a stern look. Do you have anything else to say? The god cast her eyes around and then looked straight at me with a remorseful expression. I'm sorry. I made a mistake. Explain how this happened. The god, seemingly embarrassed, began her explanation. Well, you see, I opted for the quickest method, but I made a mistake in the end. The quickest method? Yes. I copied all the settings and data from the FPS game you were playing and created a body based on that. Then, I planned to incorporate your abilities and game data into the body. It's basically a replication technique, 
However, I accidentally put you into the avatar you were using in the game. I looked at the body lying behind the god. It was supposed to be the one where my soul was supposed to be. Huh? Wouldn't it have been quicker to just put the data into that body? Well, you see, that would have taken more time. To put it simply, it would require a lot of rewriting for bug fixes, which I didn't want to deal with. The method I described earlier allows us to maintain the original model, making it easier to identify and fix any bugs. I did a thorough job on the fixes, so you don't need to worry about that. Also, I don't know if you've noticed by now, but your soul is compatible with this body. So redoing it won't work, I'm sorry. So, there was no turning back. Huh? Well, it couldn't be helped. Come to think of it, this might be more convenient. Oh? What do you mean? When we transferred, the entire class was teleported, right? Yes, that's right. What's the matter? If they find out one person is missing, ah, they'll come looking for you. Exactly. If the authorities discover that one person is missing, they'll launch a massive search and rescue operation. Since it's the government we're talking about, they might even turn the whole place upside down to find me. Right, in this form. Nobody would suspect me of being Haruto Kuramoto. I'll live as Elrina, the FPS player. I see. Okay, I understand. Let's continue with the explanation. There are some differences from the game you used to play. According to the god's explanation, the basics were the same as the game I used to play. I could see a circular radar in the upper left corner of my vision while the lower right displayed my HP, main weapon ammo, secondary weapon ammo, grenade count, healing items, and revival items on a translucent screen. When I wanted to access the menu, I just had to think about it, and it would appear, just like in the game. Other than the store you mentioned, everything seems similar to the game. There are a few other changes, the log out button and some environmental settings are gone and I added your world's everyday clothes to the store, expanded the food selection, and included daily necessities. I also expanded your item storage. I didn't tamper with the items inside, but feel free to check if anything is missing. Got it. I opened the menu, checked the storage, custom part boxes for weapons and vehicles, and the costume storage. Looks good. The increase in storage capacity from 200 to 500 is much appreciated. Great. Now, let me explain about your body. Your body isn't based on rebounds per game settings, but on FPS game settings, as I mentioned earlier. Yes, I've enhanced various aspects of your body, including your physical abilities. Also, as long as you're alive, your body will heal from any injuries, even if something is amputated. It will grow back over time. Enhanced physical abilities and regeneration. That sounds like something out of a sci-fi movie. But, in FPS games, do bodies ever get amputated? No, they don't. Even with realistic blood effects, losing limbs is unheard of. And one more thing, the most significant feature of your body is that you won't experience any of the typical issues that women do. Huh? What are you talking about? It seems you don't understand. To put it simply, you won't age even as the years pass. No matter how much you eat, you won't gain weight, you won't have to deal with heavy days. In short, you won't have any of the common female troubles. If I were to mention this to a woman, I'd definitely make an enemy for life. Do you know what they said when I told the goddesses about it? Some were jealous and said things like I'm so envious or guilty. Others declared, that person has made an enemy out of me. I will annihilate them. Jayach. Thanks to this god, I might have made enemies out of goddesses. Could you please not do anything unnecessary? Next, let's talk about weapons and equipment. Only you can use your weapons and vehicles. The god continued to explain casually. I wanted to protest, but I needed to listen to the explanation first. Even if someone else tries to take your weapons, it's okay. The moment someone other than you tries to take your weapon, it will disappear and return to your weapon storage. For vehicles, even if someone tries to start the engine, it won't work. Oh, that's convenient. My very own equipment. Furthermore, I've made it so you can handle all kinds of vehicles like a pro. Feel free to use them. I should use them sparingly to avoid drawing attention to myself. 
healing potions and revival items are equivalent to legendary items in this world, so use them wisely. Understood. In the game, you could get these items anytime, anywhere, but in reality, items with the ability to resurrect would be considered legendary. Finally, I've put 20 silver coins in your item box. Make good use of them. I'll mark the location of a town on your map. The map was marked, judging by the distance, it would take about an hour to reach. Well then, I'll get used to this body a bit before I go. Huh? Aren't you leaving immediately? Because I want to get used to this body's movements and make any necessary adjustments. Given the drastic difference in height and build, I needed to familiarize myself with the body's movements. All right, I understand. I'll maintain the barrier as it is. It will disappear the moment you step outside. If anything happens, contact me through the friends list I added for you. Goodbye. The communication with the god ended. Now then, I should move around and get used to this body a bit. I started with some shadow boxing. I performed some light warm-up exercises in place and then began shadow boxing. 46. Chapter 2. Phew, that should do it. After about 30 minutes of exercise to get used to my new body, I couldn't help but feel the difference. My height had shrunk from 175 centimeters to around 159 centimeters, estimated, and it was throwing off my sense of proportion, but no matter how much I moved, I didn't feel hindered by these strangely ample breasts. Could it be thanks to the gods doing? I decided it was time to prepare for departure. Opening the menu, I changed into a PMC style outfit, swapping my current black t-shirt and jeans for combat boots, knee pads, and a headset. I also strapped on a chest rig and donned 5.11 tactical gloves, making sure everything fit just right. Finally, I attached a CQC holster to my belt. Yeah, looking good. Next up were the weapons. For my main weapon, I chose my beloved Ace 32 chambered in 7.62x39mm, with a custom EOTech EXPS 3 sight and a 35 round magazine. As my secondary, I equipped the Jericho 941 PSL chambered in 9x19mm, along with a full tank karambit knife. Getting kind of pumped, I stashed the loaded magazines in my pouches and double checked my gear. All right preparations complete, let's go, with dreams and hopes in my heart, I set off towards the city, I had a few skirmishes with monsters on the way from the small hill where I first arrived to the road, these monsters seemed to be of lower level, as they were easily dispatched with a single shot from my Galil or one to two shots from my Jericho, I asked the god what to do with the defeated monsters, just put them in your item box, and later, you can have the guild break them down for you, oh, and when you register with the guild, make sure to choose the comprehensive guild, not the adventurer's guild, I'll send you the exchange rate for money via email later, and not that I forgot or anything, money, I guess she didn't forget after all, but why was it better to register with the comprehensive guild, well, I'd figure that out in town, it should be easy to find out, however, when I reached the road, a problem arose, for some reason, this carriage had been following me closely the whole time. Three other carriages had sped past me before I encountered this one, but unlike the others, this carriage refused to overtake me. What's more, it had five guards, all mounted on horses and dressed in matching gear. The carriage itself looked expensive, with what seemed like a family crest, so I assumed they were escorting someone important. I was wary at first, but now I was just confused. I wasn't marked as an enemy on my radar, and they hadn't said anything to me. Moreover, they didn't seem hostile, they were just following me, and it felt awkward. Ah, I can't take this anymore. Unable to endure the awkward silence, I mustered up some courage and called out to them. Yum, excuse me. <laughs> One of the guards, a man, turned his attention towards me. I felt intimidated, but I couldn't back down now. Please don't mind me you can go on ahead. He looked at his companions and then smiled as he turned back to me. Did you happen to be bothered by our presence all this time? Why yes, I was actually afraid you might kidnap me or something. Yes, don't worry, we have no intention of harming you. Besides, no one who rides in a carriage with our family crest would ever do such a thing. In fact, 
We've been trailing behind you not because of you, but because of an issue with our carriage. A woman who was part of the escort explained, What do you mean? It's a bit embarrassing, but you see, our carriage has the words stop the whore, say written on it. R, he's here. I faintly heard a voice from inside the carriage. Could it be that someone inside was ill? The man immediately ordered the coachman, stop the carriage, and the carriage came to a halt. One of the guards promptly opened the door, revealing a middle-aged man who looked pale and was on all fours, heaving. Wait, the reason the carriage was slow is, I see. This man was suffering from motion sickness, and the carriage slowed down whenever it sped up. I couldn't help but feel sympathetic. Ah, I see. I'm sorry for showing you such an embarrassing sight. Could I trouble you for some water? Of course, please wait. After that, I bought a bottle of mineral water using credits and handed it to the man. I had earned a decent amount in the game, so this expense was negligible. My name is Nelson, Nelson Diavoltk, the Duke of this region. And what's your name? I'm Eleanor. I see. By any chance, are you on your way to Gozes? Gozes. If I remembered correctly, that was the name of the city set as my destination on the map. Yes, I'm heading to the city to register at the Comprehensive Guild. I'd like to express my gratitude to you. Would you accept a ride in our carriage as a token of our appreciation? Oh, no, that's not necessary. I'm fine with just your kind words. I mean, it looked like it would smell terrible inside the carriage. Besides, traveling with nobility seemed like it would only bring trouble. We suggest you come with us. It appears you only have a knife as your weapon, despite the fact that everyone could see the guns right in front of them. It seemed that guns didn't exist in this world. Well, considering that nobility used carriages for transportation, I had already suspected as much. No, really. I'm fine on my own. The woman escorting us, Amy, seemed to notice something and pointed at the back of her horse. Well then. Why don't you ride behind my horse? It should be comfortable. For some reason, everyone seemed to agree with this idea. Did they all misunderstand something? Um, Amy-san. Yes. What is it? Is Aid always like this during missions? <laughs> Aid doesn't usually act like this. I wonder if he's in a bad mood today? Frowning like that? Was he just naturally like that? Or was it because it was his first mission? 41. Chapter 3. Let's stop the carriage because it's dangerous to proceed like this. Gul, please stop the horse. Why, is something wrong? I'm not sure if they're monsters, but there are enemies ahead. Stop the carriage and be on guard. Upon hearing this, Gul looked at me, then gave instructions to his subordinates and stopped the advance. They all took out their weapons, but one person reacted differently. Don't lie. Captain, we don't need to stop, let's keep going. Huh? Wasn't that aid? What's he saying? Aid, what are you saying? She doesn't seem to be lying. I agree with Amy. Besides, I was considering whether to stop or not because I faintly smelt people coming from the direction she mentioned. I decided to stop based on her words. It's safer to proceed carefully. Upon hearing this, Aid furrowed his brow and inexplicably glared at me before turning to Gull. It might just be adventurers hunting monsters. Well, it's possible but adventurers can be troublesome. It seemed like this conversation was going to be lengthy, so I decided to get off the horse and took out binoculars. I aimed them in the direction indicated by the radar, turned to face that direction, and used the binoculars to confirm the exact location and number of enemies. <laughs> this is strange. There are five of them over there, but they're all hiding behind trees and in the grass, watching us. It's as if they're targeting us. I turned to the side and moved my lips, indicating that they were having a discussion. So, these five are allies. Wait, did one of them just turn around? Could there be more allies behind them? As I was observing the enemies about 200 meters ahead, someone approached me from behind. Eleanor, is that true? Oh, it's Keith, the handsome one. Yes, I think the people we can see right now are probably scouts. Keith. Wasn't there a gentle right curve ahead? I had already confirmed the route on the map, so I knew which way we were going. Oh, right. What about it? I continued explaining to Gull and the others. There's a forest along the left side of the road, and the right side is an open grassy area with no cover. It looks like the perfect ambush point. 
Perhaps the enemy is planning to block our path as we reach the midpoint of the curve, engage this unit, and split us into the group fighting the blocking enemy and the group protecting the carriage. I didn't think Duke Volk would leave his carriage unguarded. What happens next? After splitting us, they'll probably shoot arrows from the side of the carriage to create chaos among the defenders while the others sneak up from behind and attack. Well, it's just my speculation. The most efficient way for them to proceed would be the method I just described. If the enemy were ignorant, they might just charge us head on, thinking that numbers would guarantee their victory. Wait, everyone's frozen, and the Duke has gotten off the carriage. Shouldn't he stay inside the carriage for safety? Um, is everyone okay? Huh? Gull noticed and began giving orders to the group. Keith, use your magic eye to confirm if the people we're seeing are enemies. Lizlina. Summon your familiar for reconnaissance. If what she says is true, there might be more enemies. Got it, Eleanor, come here. We're going to have a strategy meeting. Amy shouted loudly in Eleanor's direction, but I wonder if the people over there can hear it. Yes, I understand. Eleanor, who had been doing something in the grass, replied and then ran back to the unit. Gull sighed. Hey, Gull. Can I ask you something? Amy asked Gull with a puzzled expression. What is it? Amy, I'm the captain now. I'm sorry, captain. But what do you think of that girl? What do you mean? The two of them stared at Eleanor, who was in the grass on the right side of the road. To be honest, I don't know what to say. Who is she? An assassin from another continent? If that were the case, would she approach us like this? Besides, it's rare for an assassin to be so close to a high-profile target like us without making an attempt on their life. Amy closed her eyes and seemed to be deep in thought, but she still appeared uneasy. Yeah, you're right. Also, for some reason, Aid is acting strange today. Yeah, I noticed that too. I'm planning to talk to Aid about it later. I'd like to request the same. The two of them continued their conversation while Keith and Lizlina returned from their reconnaissance. Captain. My summoned creature, Rit, has returned. I'm done as well. I found something incredible. Good. Call Eleanor, and when she arrives, we'll start the strategy meeting. Understood. Eleanor, come over here. We're going to have a strategy meeting. Amy shouted loudly in Eleanor's direction. But can those people hear us? Yes. I understand. Eleanor, who had been doing something in the grass, replied and then ran back to the unit. Earl Eleanor sighed. First. Let's start with my report. Based on their equipment, the people who were observing us from behind the trees are most likely adventurers. When I used my appraisal skill, I found that all five of them have criminal records. Appraisal skills are handy for that kind of thing. Huh? On my end, I used my magic eye to see the thirty people, including the five Keith saw. They're split into groups of ten, either lying prone or hiding in the shadows, weapons at the ready. Also, for some reason, they don't seem to have horses. Gull listened to the report and pondered. They probably couldn't borrow horses from the stables. Unlike adventurers, that's common. Do you know their positions? Yes, the enemies are positioned as follows. Five are currently at the beginning of the curve, hidden behind the trees. Another five are hiding behind them and ten are waiting in the middle of the curve. In addition, there are ten more waiting along the roadside beyond the midpoint. If we continue like this, it seems we'll fall into the tactic Eleanor described. Captain, let's take the route through the grass on the right side. That way, we can avoid engaging with those adventurers. We can't use the grassland. When I entered it earlier to check, I found that the ground was soft in many places. If the carriage enters the grassland like this, there's a possibility it will get stuck and unable to move. Aid suggested an alternative, but I disagreed with my reasons. Aid, for some reason, gave me a hostile look again. Why does he keep glaring at me? Does he not want a young girl to speak up? Let's return to the capital. Dealing with thirty adventurers would be tough. Upon hearing Amy's words, Gull hesitated. But, they're starting to run towards us. What? Captain? It's true. The adventurers are running towards us with weapons. Keith reported in. A panic, pointing towards the forest. Everyone, prepare for combat. We'll confront the adventurers. All members of the escort unit readied their weapons, and I knew I had to cooperate. Eleanor, step back. It's dangerous. Amy said, 
but I had no intention of stepping back, it's dangerous for you to stay here, isn't it more dangerous for you, you only have a knife, right? Well, it might be easier to show than explain, I switched the Ace-32 selector from safety to semi, changed my kneeling posture to standing, and aimed at one of the enemies about 170 meters away, cover your ears, it's going to be loud, huh? I had given a warning just in case, so now it's time to take action. I aimed at the enemy and fired three shots in quick succession, a triple tap, the bullets hit the man as intended, two in the chest and one in the head, he staggered, lost his balance, and fell as if stumbling, then stopped moving. The man who had been watching this among the enemies shouted loudly, loud enough for it to be heard here. The others stopped their advance, turned around, and looked at their fallen comrade. Chaos began to spread as they realized he was dead. My first kill. But if I worry about that now, I might get killed myself. I need to keep taking down the enemy. They're completely exposed. The enemies who had been standing still were now my targets. I aimed at the first one fired three shots, and when he fell, I fired two more into his chest, he stopped moving, but this way, I wouldn't finish them off before they reached me, I had no choice, after taking down the fourth enemy, I changed my objective from killing enemies to stopping their movement, I changed my aiming method, targeting enemies from the rightmost to the leftmost as if drawing points and fired in bursts when the crosshairs lined up, if I ran out of bullets along the way, I'd reload and continue shooting from where I left off, at a distance of about 25 meters. Most of the enemies were either injured, stopped in their tracks with bullets in various parts of their bodies, or incapacitated and unable to move. The enemy sensed that they were at a disadvantage and started shouting and running away. I shot one in the knee to prevent him from escaping. Now, let's retrieve that person and hear what they have to say. Their story might be different or they might say it's not worth it, they could be working for someone. Ah, yeah, that's right, your iron rod is a weapon, isn't it? Gul asked me after hearing my explanation. Yes, that's right, it's a weapon that only I can use. The others were staring at me in shock. No way. Taking on 30 adventurers by yourself? Who are you? Why are you asking me? I'm probably just a regular person. Maybe? Why are you asking me of all people? Well, it's because I'm not sure if I can even be called human, considering that my body was made by a god. Right? Afterward, Amy's loud voice echoed across the grassland, and the story continued. 40. Chapter 4 After calming down the screaming Amy, I retrieved the enemy I had shot in the leg last and began questioning them. They surprisingly started talking to me right away. Why? Well, putting that aside, according to what they said, they were hired by Lord Gozes for money. They had no idea that the request from the Lord involved attacking the Duke. If they had known, they would have refused the request, they claimed. Also, regarding the adventurers who escaped during the recent battle, they would be pursued and investigated by the country. With the questions done rather quickly, I tried to collect the scattered casings and magazines I had discarded, but they had vanished without a trace. I recall. In that game, casings and used magazines would disappear from the ground if left unattended for about five seconds. I think that mechanism is at work here. Well, it's sort of convenient. Afterward, Aid, Keith, and Amy went ahead to scout and confirm safety. Will and Lizlina started treating the survivors to some extent before binding them with ropes and putting them to sleep with magic. The deceased ones were gathered and burned. To be honest, it's pretty gruesome, so I don't want to watch too closely. Gul, why are you burning the bodies, huh? Don't you know why we're doing this? Lizlina also had an expression that seemed to say, you don't know? Ah, uh, well, yes, I didn't know. The god never told me about corpse disposal methods. Really, such an unhelpful god. I'm starting to lose track of who you really are, Gul muttered quietly, but you see. One of the features of the headset I'm wearing right now is a microphone. Moreover, it's set slightly higher, so I can hear everything clearly. Gul sighed deeply and began to explain. Listen, if you leave human corpses without doing anything, there are two possibilities. Monsters might come to eat the corpses and become obstacles on the road, 
or the corpses might turn into zombies and attack indiscriminately. Well, usually, corpses get devoured by monsters before they turn into zombies, so zombie corpses are rare. I see, that's interesting. What about the severed heads in the bags? Honestly, I don't want to touch those bags, so please don't hand them to me. But is it safe? Oh, with these heads, we can use magic to extract their memories, find out what they were up to. However, no matter how hard we try, we can only glimpse fragments of their memories, usually covering the last three days. You see, memory read isn't an all-powerful spell, so if we could capture them alive, it would be much appreciated on our end. Capturing and handing them over to soldiers might be challenging. If you've captured thieves and let your guard down for a moment, they might escape. Still, I wouldn't want to carry their heads around either. You belong to the adventurer department of the Comprehensive Guild, right? If you submit these along with your guild card, you might get reward. Do remember that. Adventurer department? Not adventurers? Adventurer department. Huh? Cutting off a few heads will prevent them from turning into zombies. Usually, after beheading a few people, it's common to burn the remaining bodies. I wanted to ask what the difference was between adventurers and the adventurer department, but Lizlina answered right after Gull, so I couldn't. Oh well, I'll figure it out later. Is it okay to leave those bound people here without taking them? If it's just one or two, we could put them on horses but it's impossible to take nine with us. So, I understand leaving the rest of the adventurers, but, is it safe to leave them like this? They might become monsters prey if left here, although it's unlikely. But when the hypnosis spell wears off, they might untie themselves and run away. I doubt that, but those who escaped earlier might return with reinforcements. A, it's fine. We've set up a barrier with a boundary stone so they won't be attacked by monsters. Moreover, the hypnosis spell is double-layered, so they won't wake up easily. Besides, we've collected all their weapons, so even if they wake up and try to escape somewhere, they can't handle the monsters with just magic. They'll feel the danger and won't come out of the barrier. We'll contact the capital's soldiers to pick them up, so rest assured. What about the possibility of those who ran away coming to rescue them? Almost 0%. They should understand that they'll be pursued, and it's unlikely they'll come to help. Even if they did, we've captured three of them, so we can interrogate them. In other words, they have three options, either become monster food by trying to escape, surrender and be safely escorted to town, or try to survive in hiding with their companions. The last choice doesn't seem likely since they were running away without even trying to wake their fallen comrades. Their sense of camaraderie seems thin. I understand. Thank you for the explanation. I received more useful information from Gull and the others than from the god. When Aid and the others returned from their reconnaissance, they reported that there were no survivors. With that settled, we decided to proceed. Before departing, Lizlina summoned two fluffy creatures and gave each of them a letter instructing them to deliver one to the capital and the other to Gozes. I really wanted to pet those fluffy creatures, and before leaving, Duke Vold thanked me. If you hadn't been here, we might have lost our lives. I thank you on behalf of everyone. Is it really okay for the Duke to bow so easily? Well, I'm not used to this kind of thing, so I'd rather he stopped. Don't worry about it, huh? I ended up making a weird noise because I felt embarrassed. He he. Well, it seems there's something unexpectedly cute about you. Amy said softly, but I didn't have time to care. I was feeling so embarrassed. While we were chatting, we arrived at Goza's gate. As soon as we did, the gatekeepers lined up to welcome us. Everyone, Nelson dear Volk, Duke of Goza's, is here. Everyone, salute. One of the gatekeepers said, and all the gatekeepers placed their left hand on their chests, stretched out their right hands straight and made a strange gesture in front of their left hands. That must be a salute. Everyone, you can relax. With those words, the gatekeepers stopped saluting and stood straight. Who's in charge of the gatekeepers here? I am, sir. The person in the center stepped forward and responded. Have you read the messenger? Yes, sir. We've reread it and acted immediately. We are currently conducting a forced investigation of the Adventurers Guild, Devta we believe was involved in this case. A forced investigation exists in this world, too. I see. 
As soon as the investigation is complete today, we will report it through the night order, the Duke nodded, approvingly. Understood, I await your report. Everyone, return to your posts. With one word, the gatekeepers lined up again and performed another salute, after which they scattered like birds. As I passed through the gate, I thought to myself, oh right, I forgot to ask if the letters we sent out would actually reach their destinations. I hope they do. Just in case. 39. Chapter 5. After riding Amy's horse, I became curious about various things, so I decided to ask Gulsan. Um, Gulsan. What's up? Why are you and your group going to the Comprehensive Guild? Huh? Didn't we discuss our purpose? Well. No. I don't think we did. Fortunately, Liz Lena remembered. Oh, right. We didn't discuss it. Our purpose is to inspect the branch of the Comprehensive Guild. Inspection? Wait a minute. That sounds suspicious. If it's just an inspection, couldn't your subordinates handle it? The moment Gulsan heard my words, he furrowed his eyebrows. This time, it became a situation where the Duke must be present. Huh? What do you mean? It seems the local nobles have been causing trouble for the Comprehensive Guild, and there's a possibility of corruption within the Guild itself. So, the chairman of the Comprehensive Guild came out to investigate. Excuse me, Amy-san, what do you mean, the chairman of the Comprehensive Guild, could it be? Duke Bard is not only the chairman of the Comprehensive Guild on this continent but also the chairman of the Comprehensive Guild for the entire relevant continent. Elena. Didn't you know? There's no way I could have known that on my first day of reincarnation. Besides, isn't the chairman of the Comprehensive Guild quite an important person? WWW, I was left speechless by Liz Lena's explanation. All right. We've arrived. Huh? Oh my. It's the Comprehensive Guild. It's pretty noisy inside. Did something happen? Is it a fight? No, that doesn't make sense. The voices I can hear leaking out sound more like a tense situation. Could it be? I felt a shiver down my spine, so I turned around hastily, and Gulsan and the others had transformed into completely different people. Duke Bard Gulsan signaled something to the Duke with his eyes. Well, Elena san, would you mind lending me your strength? Huh, really? More trouble? Gender change due to reincarnation. Then almost being put into the Duke's suspicious carriage. How many times is it today? If it's okay with me, I'll help. I said that, but I really wanted to refuse. Thank you. Now, let's go. For now, I stashed Ace 32, my main weapon, in the armory. As I didn't want to accidentally hit any civilians, I drew Jericho 941 PSL from its holster as I followed Duke Bardk. While following Duke Bardk, I quickly prepared myself. As we entered the Comprehensive Guild, the sounds of shouting and screaming were much clearer than when we were outside. What I witnessed there was a flashy man in expensive looking clothes kicking a man who seemed to be a guild employee and yelling at the counter. Do you idiots understand? If you don't listen to what I say, you'll end up like him. Do you even realize what you're doing? Just because you're the lord of this town doesn't mean you can commit such crimes. We're issuing an arrest warrant. The guild employee at the counter protested. But the flashy man, with a despicable smile, showed a bloody knife to the employee and started saying crazy things. What? What's this? You commoners dare speak to me? The Lord, like this? Are you listening? If you don't listen to me, you'll meet the same fate. You're no longer a Lord. It's no longer acceptable, no matter how much you rule this town. We're issuing an arrest warrant. The guild employee continued to protest. But the flashy man, who finally turned towards us, still had his knife pointed at the guild employee. Why can you decide that? Isn't it the duty of the nobility to judge criminals? Duke Bardk, with an angry expression, said that he had passed his limit and looked astonished. Do you even know what you're saying? Are you an idiot? I'm the lord of this town. That means I am the law. Therefore, you are all sentenced to death for defying me. Guild master, you and that damn clerk finally turning towards us. The flashy man froze like he had ice water poured on his head when his knife, which he had been pointing at us, flew somewhere. At first, he didn't understand what had happened. With a face showing that he didn't understand what was happening, he looked at his right hand. The moment he saw his right hand, his face twisted in pain, 
and he began to scream with tears in his eyes. This guy is truly an idiot, if he wanted to escape, he shouldn't have let go of the knife he was using to threaten others. To be honest, it was easy to shoot him. You, what are you doing? Put your hands behind your head and lie down slowly. If you don't do as I say, I'll shoot again. WH who are you? To decide my fate. While visibly terrified, the idiot, instead of tears, was now producing sweat and mucus from his face as he started speaking. Are you still talking at a time like this? Move away from there now. Do you want this civilian to die in vain? Gulsan said stopping and gesturing to his subordinates to apprehend the idiot. Carry him here in front of me. After taking care of the idiot, Duke Bard corded, you will be interrogated and tried later. Depending on the circumstances, you might escape the death penalty if you're lucky, but you won't avoid serious charges. Do you have anything to say? I I didn't do anything wrong, it's all their fault, it's Viz's fault, Levate's fault. After all this, you still want to talk? Take this criminal away. Upon Duke Bard's instructions, Gulsan replied with a understood and took the idiot away. Now, all that's left is to investigate the damage to this guild. Oh, Elena, thanks to you, we managed to catch that guy. Thank you. No, please don't mention it. Ha, 34. Chapter 6 After receiving thanks from Duke Bard, I was told by a guild employee who had been yelling at Grubert to come along. They brought me to a reception room on the other side of the counter. Amy and Lizrina were providing first aid to the stabbed guild employee, while Aid and Keith were questioning Grubert. I understand the girl is in the reception room, but do they really need to bring me there too? So, Guildmaster, could you tell us about the extent of the damage? Yes, this has been happening for a while now. Grubert demanded taxes from me, threatened to take the comprehensive guild's funds and insisted that I follow his rules, saying, even though I made these rules, obey them, commoner. He also harassed comprehensive guild employees, and some even faced minor assaults, it seems Grubert instructed adventurers to target our staff. There doesn't appear to be any significant information leakage, but I'll investigate further just to be sure. This guy is the guild master. That your guy, Grubert really went too far. I've heard there's damage in the city too, is that true? The guild master lowered his gaze for some reason and then looked straight at Duke Bard. Yes, there have been reports from the citizens regarding that matter, Galley. Please inform the comprehensive guild, the man standing next to the guild master said, yes, and then pulled out a bundle of papers from his pocket. According to reports from citizens, Grubert was raising taxes without permission and forcibly making people pay. Those who couldn't pay were subjected to violence or murder as a warning. In the city's restaurants, weapon shops, armor shops, and general stores, Grubert engaged in free dining, unpaid tabs, and claimed contributions, but in reality, he was robbing them. There are also reports of missing citizens in the city, most of whom are connected to Grubert and some evidence confirms this. While there hasn't been any significant information leakage, we'll investigate further just to be safe. There's no way to escape from this now. With all these reports at the Comprehensive Guild alone, it looks like we can strip his title without a trial through home investigation. It seems like title stripping is already certain, as far as I can tell. By the way, Chairman Bard, I've been curious since earlier. Who is that young lady over there? It's natural to have questions. I'm neither Duke Bard's guard nor a maid. Oh, I haven't introduced her yet. Her name is Eleanor. She not only informed us about the ambush by those barbaric adventurers but also helped us fend them off, allowing us to arrive safely in Gozes. And, most importantly, she played a crucial role in capturing Grubert. Honestly, this girl is a lifesaver. Um, nice to meet you. My name is Eleanor. I introduced myself and the guild master looked at me with a smile, nice to meet you, my name is Barbara Stitos, and I'm a human, as you can see, the person next to me is Gally, I'm Gally, I don't have a family name, I want to express my gratitude for helping our employees earlier and assisting in capturing Grubert, I also want to thank you, thank you, the guild master bowed his head while saying this, eh no, not at all, I said, blushing, <laughs> oh, Barbus. Don't worry about it, please continue with the discussion. Is that so? Well, 
This young lady seems to have come to register with the Comprehensive Guild. Please proceed with the registration process. After hearing Duke Berg's explanation, everyone had surprised expressions on their faces. Are you really registering with the Comprehensive Guild? Can you do that with these stats? Well, I'm not really sure if my stats are good or not. But, yeah, I guess they're normal. I mean, there's no way you can represent an FPS player's stats within rebounds per game game stat display. So, this display isn't incorrect, and no way, this is far from normal, I can't believe it. Huh? Deja vu, I feel like I've seen this scene before. Is there a problem with my stats? Everyone in the room, except me, froze in place. Eleanor, how do you feel about your displayed stats? In the midst of this, Duke Bard asked me touching my chin while I thought about my displayed stats. Well, I don't know if they're normal or not, but, yeah, if I think about it, they seem pretty normal. Because when I was Haruto Kuramoto, I was 17, so I assumed I inherited the same age. Are these stats real? Amy, you know that the true crystal doesn't display fake stats, right? Do you think she could fake this? Well, yeah. If she were faking it, she'd probably make her stats look better. But, seriously, are you really 15? And with that chest, you still have room to grow. While Amy said that, she had an expression of disbelief. However, these stats are abnormal. Magic power at zero, no skills, and an unknown class. This is, is there a problem? Um, is there something wrong with my stats? I was thoroughly explained about the abnormality of my stats after that. 34. Chapter 7. Let's create your guild card for now. Finally, I was freed from the lecture that could only be described as preaching. While I was exhausted and slouched, Gally took out a blank card. Please let a drop of your blood fall here. I took out my karambit knife and lightly cut my right thumb, letting a drop fall onto the card. The card emitted a glow and then transformed into a card with engraved letters. Elena Chan. Let me heal your finger. Please extend your hand, Elena san. It's okay. It'll heal on its own. No way. You're a girl, so you have to take care of your body. Come on, give me your hand. Elena's tone had changed, likely because she found out we were the same age. She had returned to her usual way of speaking and lost her stern expression, now wearing a gentle one. Your way of speaking has changed from earlier, Elena san. He he. I do it to create a clear distinction between work and normal conversations. Anyway, give me your hand. Elena took my right hand and examined my thumb. Huh? The wound is gone. Did you heal it yourself? Elena looked puzzled as she examined my right thumb, which I had cut with the karambit. No, it's not that. I heal quickly. So for minor wounds like this, you don't need to worry. Elena Chan's body is quite mysterious. By the way, your hands are so beautiful, I'm jealous. Elena gazed at my hands enviously. I wonder if many girls are concerned about things like beauty and skin condition, staring at me like this. Cough. Can we proceed with the explanation? Of course. Oops, I forgot. I was in the middle of joining the Comprehensive Guild. This is your Comprehensive Guild card. It also serves as your identification, and any crimes you commit will be recorded on the card. Additionally, if you lose your card, there is a fee for reissuing it, so be careful not to lose it. Understand? Yes, I understand. Now, please take this. I received the card from Galley. Next, let me explain the adventurer class you belong to. Adventurer classes have ranks based on an individual's skill level, and your card will have it listed. I see. It's quite standard. The ranks are from lowest to highest. E, D, C, B, A and S, with E being the starting rank for all comprehensive guild members. So your rank will also start at E. To raise your rank, you'll need to accept quests at the reception desk, complete tasks like defeating monsters or gathering items, and accumulate quest points. Once you've gathered a certain number of points, you'll be eligible to take a rank up quest, and if you pass it, you'll be able to rank up. However, be aware that you won't earn points just by following others on quests without contributing. For example, if you don't engage in combat with monsters and only deliver finishing blows, you won't earn points. So, be cautious. Furthermore, 
whether you can take a rank up quest or not will be notified to you by us. I see, you can't climb the ranks just by riding on others accomplishments. Also, you can only accept quests that match your rank. E rank adventurers can only take E rank quests, and so on. However, there are exceptions, but I can't discuss those until you reach C rank, so I won't mention them now. When you want to take a rank up quest beyond rank C, you'll need to meet the quest point requirements and complete mandatory quests to be eligible. Do you have any questions so far? Yes, I do. I need to ask this before anything else. Is there a penalty for failing quests? I was about to explain that next. Oh, no. Did I do something wrong? If you fail a quest, there will indeed be penalties, for hunting and gathering quests. It's a deduction of quest points. For escort and transport quests, aside from quest point deductions, there might be cases where you have to pay a penalty fee. Additionally, if you continuously fail quests, your rank might be downgraded, so please be careful. I see, there's a penalty fee sometimes. I should be cautious. May I ask a question? Of course, if a quest fails due to issues with the client during escort or transport quests, and they say it's your fault, demanding a penalty fee, do you have to pay it? You don't need to worry about that. In case of issues, we generally mediate to determine whether you should pay a penalty fee. Besides, to request escort and transport quests. You generally need to register with the Comprehensive Guild under the Commercial or Production Departments, except for certain influential figures like royalty. Also, attempting to demand pay more or reduce the reward on the spot is considered an illegal act by the Comprehensive Guild, so such individuals are unlikely to exist. On the flip side, if adventurers demand increased rewards from clients, it's also against the Comprehensive Guild's rules. You should already know this, but committing crimes for monetary gain, including killing clients, is a serious offense, so absolutely refrain from it. Okay, if there are such rules in place, I don't need to worry. Finally, the higher your rank, the higher paying quests you can undertake, but they also come with higher risks, so I recommend forming parties. Parties, huh? Well, I can think about that later. That concludes the basic information. If you have any questions, Feel free to ask at the counter. Thank you very much. No, thank you. With that, my guild registration was complete. Afterward, the guild master instructed the guild employees to bring Grubert here for questioning. In the meantime, everyone was waiting and chatting while expecting Grubert to arrive. But suddenly, the door was forcefully pushed open, shattering the friendly atmosphere. Captain Gill, what are you doing, Keith? We're in the presence of the Duke. Despite Gull's angry tone, Keith seemed flustered and out of breath. Something must have happened. This is no time for that. Gull furrowed his brow and looked at Keith. Is something wrong? I'll explain later. Please come with me and stop paid. What? Stop paid. What does that mean? I was puzzled as I made my way to the scene, only to find Dade outside, landing punches on Grubert, who was restrained. You scum. I knew it. Grubert's face was swollen and several teeth were missing, likely from aid repeatedly hitting him. Despite his battered state, Grubert weakly started speaking while gazing at aid. Yeah, it's true. After dealing with you, I was going to tack take a family hostage. I'll kill your family if you don't follow the orders of Levi's. Please spare me, Grubert with tears, snot, and blood smeared on his face, pleaded with aid, but aid's anger showed no signs of subsiding as he clenched his fist. Aid, stop it already, Gull shouted, but aid seemed oblivious, Gull shouted, but aid seemed oblivious and continued to strike, huh? What's going on here? I needed to intervene before things got seriously out of hand, but there was a phrase in Eleanor's words that caught my attention so I involuntarily stopped in my tracks. Where is my family? If you don't want to talk, I'll kill you. What? Family? Does that mean aid? Huh? Th there. In there. Basement. There's a hidden door. In the study. I. I threw them. Down there. There. Still. Alive. I beg. You. Spare. Me. As Grubert realized our presence, he begged for help. Aid. Stop it. This isn't like you. Aid, senior, 
Please stop, Aid. Let it go. Will and the others tried to restrain Aid while he struggled. Hearing the recent conversation confirmed my suspicions. I had hoped it wasn't true, but, I had to ask. I believed Aid would tell me everything now. Um, Aid, could it be that Grubert has taken your family hostage? Up until that point, Aid had been struggling and showing anger, but when I asked, he stopped struggling abruptly, and his expression changed to one of sadness and agony. Yeah, that's right, I was. Blackmailed by him, my family. Taken. Hostage. As soon as he said those words, everyone except me was shocked. Gull let go of Aid and stepped back. Then, he began questioning Aid. So, the reason you were acting strangely today was because your family was taken hostage? Yeah, two days ago. My family was kidnapped. And on that day, the kidnapper told me, the day after tomorrow. If you don't cooperate in assassinating Duke Voltk, your family will be killed. If you dare tell anyone about this, do you know what will happen to your family? So, that's what happened. That's why Aid was giving me those menacing looks earlier. I managed to find out about the location of my family and the mastermind, but I had no time to rescue them, and I was desperate. So, that's why I, today tried to betray you all. Will and the others had incredulous expressions on their faces. Aid. You, was the place where we were attacked the location of the planned operation? But why didn't Aid show up as an enemy on the radar? Well, I'll ask the gods about that later. Yeah, that's right. At the moment of failure, I hated you. But after the battle, when I thought about it more, I wondered if they planned to dispose of me as well right there. I asked him myself and it turned out I was right. Aid had a regretful expression. I'm sorry, there was nothing else I could do. Even if I apologize, I don't think I can be forgiven. Aid. I felt sorry for Aid and the others, but we needed to take action immediately to rescue Aid's family. Also, we should hand Grubert over to the authorities. There are things I want to ask him. Let's postpone the rest of the conversation for later. We'll inform the guild staff about the hidden room and have them go check it out. Also, there are some questions I'd like to ask Grubert, so can you leave him to me? Very well. By the way, Elena, what do you want to ask him about Levi's? I turned to Gil and replied. I want to know about what Grubert mentioned regarding Levi's. As I did so, a loud noise came from Grubert's direction. I turned to look and saw a thick stone spear impaled in Grubert's chest causing him to collapse. With this, the guild registration is complete. 26. Chapter 8. We were puzzled as we watched Grubert suddenly collapse, and even Lazrina had her mouth covered as she shouted, What's going on? Is there an enemy lurking somewhere? Damn it! Everyone, stay alert! Following Gull's instructions, Amy and the others took up their weapons, scanning the surroundings and becoming vigilant. Could it be that he was silenced to keep him from talking? Grubert. What have you gotten yourself into? Duke Bard exclaimed, wide-eyed as he looked at Grubert. I looked at Grubert's lifeless body, momentarily stunned, but as soon as I heard Gull's words, I shook my head, and then I took out my Jericho 941 PSL and Karambit knife from my holster. The enemy had to be nearby, judging from how the spear was stuck in Grubert, it had come from the opposite direction. They were probably over there. I turned my face toward the direction it had come from, searching, and our eyes met with a hooded figure. In that moment, perhaps sensing danger, they ran toward a narrow alleyway. Gull, over there. Someone with a hood is running into the alley. We need to follow them. I pointed toward the alley, but Gull looked a bit uneasy, perhaps concerned for the Duke's safety. Gull, you're the captain, right? Don't be shaken. Give your subordinates the appropriate orders. I urged Gull who then turned to his subordinates and began issuing orders. Keith, aid, follow me. Amy and Lizrina, protect the Duke. Hi, Eleanor. What are you? What are you doing? Gull, who saw me pulling the stone spear from Grubert's chest, furrowed his brows, perhaps out of anger. Don't worry about me. Hurry up and follow them. I'll catch up later. Fine. We'll go ahead. Gull said this, and with Keith and aid, he ran toward the alley. Good. I removed the stone spear. Since the resurrection mark hadn't disappeared, I just needed to use a healing potion, and Grubert would be fine. I opened the menu, took out a healing potion I had in storage, 
and injected the liquid into Grubert's body. To be honest, I can't stand this guy, but I have a lot of questions for him, so he can't die. I did this because I remembered what Gu had mentioned on the way here about memory read. Memory read was a magic that allowed the reading of memories from a deceased person's mind. It could access fragmented memories from just before their death up to three days prior. This meant that the person who stabbed Grubert with the stone spear likely didn't want us to know anything that had happened more than three days ago. Otherwise, they would have killed us to prevent any questions. With the healing potions liquid fully absorbed into Grubert's body, I removed the injection needle. By the time the light emanating from Grubert's body disappeared, his wounds had healed and he was lying there without any injuries, he's alive, did you perhaps use a secret potion on him, I'm sorry, Amy, but I'm going to reunite with Gull and the others now, we can discuss the rest later, I said this and opened the menu again, taking out a small reconnaissance drone and sending it flying into the air, I set it to auto mode to track the culprit, understood, I will search for the target, with those words, the drone soared into the sky, all right, everyone, I'll be back, be careful, Eleanor, we don't know who the enemy is, I understand, I replied to Duke Bardk, who had somehow stopped adding San to my name, and then I began to run toward the alley, target confirmed, pursuing, good, now it was showing up on the radar, all I had to do was chase them down, caution, possible danger at 11 o'clock, enemy presence detected, enemy, in this narrow alleyway, moreover, there was an enemy marker in the same direction as the culprit. What was going on? Could it be reinforcements? Or did Gull and the others fall into the enemy's trap? Either way, it's the same direction, so I have to go and see. As I approached, I saw Gull and the others fighting five humanoid monsters. Jigal. Gull looked at the enemies and replied, Elena, lend us a hand. Understood. I could ask for reasons later. For now. We had to defeat these creatures. I aimed my Ace-32 and quickly shot down one of the creatures with semi-automatic fire, then the one next to it with three shots in rapid succession. Well done, Eleanor. Wuggle said that to me. He cleaved one of the monsters in half with his massive sword. Thunder, dwell in my hand. Thunderball. The humanoid monster hit by Keith's spell seemed to be paralyzed, standing still and shaking uncontrollably. Now, aid. Got it. As Keith's magic immobilized the monster, Aid finished it off with her sword. Just one left. As I aimed at the last monster, it suddenly disappeared in a burst of light. It disappeared. What's going on? Target lost. Searching for the target. Huh? Lost the target? That couldn't be true. Unless it was destroyed or used a jamming device, it was nearly impossible for our tracking drone to lose the target, even if it hid inside a building. They turn left at that corner. Everyone, follow them. Understood. As I was bewildered, Will and the others said this and ran toward the corner. W wait for me. I followed them, peeking my head around the corner. To my surprise, Will and the others were standing in the middle of the road at a dead end. I approached Gull and asked, Gull, where's the culprit? Gull looked at me and replied, they got away, since their scent stops here. They likely use teleportation magic. I see. The drone disappeared because they teleported suddenly. But, Captain Gill, if they use teleportation magic, there should be a teleportation circle nearby. I don't see one anywhere. Keith, they probably used a magic-infused paper for teleportation. Look at this. It was lying there. Aid showed us some burnt scraps, and Keith widened his eyes. Magic-infused paper? But if they use teleportation paper, they shouldn't be able to travel far. They should be somewhere nearby. Let's search this area. No, it's impossible. They likely called us here, and while we were dealing with the monsters, they used a pre-prepared escape teleportation circle somewhere else. Then, they probably used another long-range teleportation spell at that location to get away. The fact that the monsters disappeared as well probably means that they were no longer needed to deal with us. It's the most reasonable explanation. Yeah. Considering the activation time and marks left by teleportation circles, that's the most likely scenario. If there was a teleportation circle here, we could investigate and track them. But, it's a shame. As I tried to make sense of the situation, 
It was clear that this enemy was far from ordinary. Grubert's capture and the speedy attempt on his life didn't add up. It seemed like Grubert had been up against a powerful organization. What? What was I even dealing with? No one could answer my question. 24. Chapter 9. We accidentally let the culprit who tried to kill Gerberth escape, and we returned to Amy San's place following the original path, informing her that it was an alley. Amy San sighed, saying, That's a shame, isn't it? She added, Duke Bardk, I was worried that you all wouldn't come back safely. Are you planning not to return? She expressed her concerns. Later, Eleanor San burst into tears, saying, I'm glad everyone is safe. If you didn't come back, I. As tears streamed down her face. By the way, Gerberth, the mastermind of this incident, regained consciousness thanks to my revival potion. I thought he might run away as soon as he regained consciousness, but he seemed resigned and confessed everything about this incident and the encounter with Riz. Gerberth's encounter with Riz dates back six months ago. He was suddenly summoned by his father and told the following, Gerberth, pack your things and leave this house tomorrow. You are disowned. Upon hearing these words, Gerberth naturally protested to his father, asking, Why do I, the heir, have to leave the house? But his father's response was cold. Do you know what you've been doing all this time? You've been playing around without following my instructions, assaulting citizens, getting caught by soldiers. Moreover, you caused trouble at the Leadgum Magic Academy and got expelled. Can I entrust this house and the city to someone like you? As for the heir, it would be fine to adopt a talented relative. At least, I think the child I'm considering for adoption is better than you. Am I wrong? Gerberth couldn't say a word after that. He had no choice but to obey his parents. However, on that night, someone with a hooded cloak appeared on Gerberth's balcony, offering to fulfill his dream of becoming the lord of the city. Gerberth was skeptical at first, but as he listened to the one-sided story, he began to find it credible. That's when the person, who turned out to be this, brought up the idea of a contract. Would you like to become the lord of this city? If so, I can make your dream come true, and if you enter into a contract to cooperate with my business, your income will be higher than your father's. Whether you cooperate or not is up to you. The moment Gerberth heard these words, he signed the contract. After this confirmed Gerberth's signature and seal on the contract, he introduced himself. From now on, we will be business partners, so let me tell you my name. I'm called Vis. Nice to meet you. Oh, and it will take about a week for you to become the Lord as I promised. So, stay in this city and wait. There are various preparations to be made. With that, Vis disappeared into the night. I thought I had done something foolish, but three days later, both of my parents passed away and there was no one left to succeed them but me. Just like that, things fell into place smoothly, and within ten days, I became the Lord. Gerberth himself was surprised by this outcome, wondering if it was all a dream. Just when he was thinking that, Vis appeared again and asked if he was willing to cooperate according to the contract. How about it, Gerberth? Will you cooperate as per the contract? Gerberth promised. I will cooperate with anything that marked the beginning of Gerberth and Vis's misdeeds in Gozes. As we bid farewell to Gerberth, who was taken away by the soldiers to the dungeon, Duke Bard and I returned to the Comprehensive Guild for information gathering. I am here as an important witness. Based on Gerberth's testimony, we searched his residence and found documents related to illegal drugs, illegal magical artifacts, and tools. We also found contracts related to illegal slaves. It seems there's no escape from serious charges. Furthermore, when we investigated the underground room Gerberth mentioned, we found the missing family members of Aidsan and the others who disappeared in Gozes. Unfortunately, three of them had already passed away, and the remaining four had been turned into slaves and sold somewhere. The Comprehensive Guild will handle the investigation of these cases. Aidsan who had been reunited with her family, thanked me profusely to the point where I thought it was excessive. Also, regarding this, the name does not appear in the city's entry records, so it is likely that the name Vis is a pseudonym. We are currently investigating how Vis infiltrated the city, and we will report the results as soon as we have more information. Do you have any questions at this point? Elena-san, in work mode, 
opened her notebook and turned her gaze toward me, looking at everyone in the comprehensive guild reception room. Um, Eleanor San, I have two questions, may I? Eleanor San turned her attention to me, raising her hand. Please, go ahead, Eleanor San. My first question is, did anyone see the family members of Aid San being abducted? As of now, no one has reported witnessing the abduction. We are continuing to investigate the modus operandi and circumstances. So, no witnesses yet. My second question is, did anyone else hear the name Vis besides Gerbeth? Regarding the name Vis, those who knew it include the servants who worked at Gerbeth's residence, the slave trading company, Blummer, including Vis Blummer and several employees of the company, as well as the adventurer guild, Detta, including Detta, they were aware of Vis's name my name as the guild's name. Well, let's put that aside. Were there any citizens who knew the name? We are currently investigating. But so far, there have been no reports or citizens knowing the name. I see. Something doesn't sit right. Next, regarding the slave trading company, this Blummer, who was mentioned earlier, it seems that they were involved in illegal transactions through Gerbeth. They were involved in the trade of magical artifacts, slaves and drugs, among other things, and they were also the mastermind behind the sale of the four citizens found in Gerbeth's underground chamber. Come to think of it, the guild's chairman was arrested in front of the shop while trying to board a cart loaded with goods. Eleanor, may I ask a question? Eleanor placed her gaze back on Duke Bardk. Yes, what is it, Duke Bardk? Did you manage to determine the smuggling methods and sources of supply for the illegal goods? Sorry. But we're still in the process of investigation. Both Blummer and Gerbeth have said that they know nothing about the source of their goods. Blummer claimed to have bought the items without asking Gerbeth any questions, and Gerbeth, who was purchasing, had a contract clause stating that he shouldn't ask anything from this when buying. So, even Gerbeth couldn't find out the source. Dot. Well, if you're a magic user and you have plenty of money, it's not surprising that you can buy magic artifacts without any questions. That's why we need to focus on investigating the source of the goods and the methods of smuggling. We will also need to look into any other transactions involving illegal goods. There is still much work to be done, Baron Bardk nodded in agreement. Is there anything else you need to know? If possible, I would like to talk to Gerbeth and this. Gerbeth is currently being held in the dungeon, if you want to talk to him you will need to go through the prison warden, as for this, he is also being detained in a separate facility, but we can arrange for a meeting if you want, please arrange a meeting with both of them, understood, I will arrange it for you, if you need any additional information or assistance, please don't hesitate to ask, Baron Bard and I were shown to a separate room in the comprehensive guild, where we waited for the arrangements to be made, I wonder what kind of people Gerbeth and Vis are like, 24. Chapter 10. After that, I heard from Guildmaster Barbos San, who is the overall guild leader, that the building next to the branch of the General Guild where I forgot to get lodging is a lodging facility for those who couldn't get lodging like me. Originally, it should have been paid, but as a thank you for helping the guild staff, I was allowed to use it for free. Phew. Today has been quite eventful. After saying that, I collapsed onto the bed wearing only a t-shirt and pants. I did take a bath and dried my hair with a battery-powered hair dryer, though. Even though it's my own body. Why do I feel so nervous? Ugh. The image of my own body in the bathroom came to mind, and suddenly my face flushed, and I started feeling embarrassed. Ugh. Overwhelmed by embarrassment, I shook my head vigorously, telling myself to forget it. Then, I rolled onto the bed and groaned in agony. Ah. If this was going to happen, I should have created a male character. Ugh. While saying this, I curled up and writhed in discomfort, and suddenly a communication sound entered my ears. Huh? It's a communication. Nobody else but a god, right? Oh, that was a surprise. Hello, god here. Well, you got involved in some tough stuff on your first day of reincarnation. Huh? It's a good thing I enhanced your abilities before reincarnating you. By the way, why are you blushing? It's nothing, but I do think you might be behind today's events. Am I wrong? I stared at the god on the screen with a suspicious look. 
but the god responded with a laugh. Too bad, but you're wrong. You just got involved by chance. Is that really true? More importantly, there's something I need to tell you. Is there a problem? First of all, as a thank you for saving the guild chairman, I'll give you some CP credit points as a reward. He was an essential figure on this continent, and I can't imagine what would have happened if he had been lost. So, Duke Baldeck was such an important figure. I'm glad I helped him. Also, as a reward for your efforts, I'll give you information about the Adventurers Guild, Magical Tools, and the Radar. And finally, I have a special announcement for you. The last part is the most intriguing. In a bad way. 5000 points as a thank you for saving the Guild Chairman. Oh. That's generous. I didn't turn much CP today, maybe around 1000 points, so this helps. Here, I've transferred 5000 points to you. Now, let me explain about the Adventurers Guild. Please go ahead. I apologize for not explaining this earlier. It was my oversight. The Adventurers Guild is a place where rough people gather, and there are practically no rules within it, leading to many engaging in criminal activities. Moreover, the Adventurers Guild lacks strong connections between its members, so outsiders often face discrimination and suspicion when entering towns or the capital. In some cases, they may even be closely monitored for unreasonable reasons. On the other hand, the General Guild is well regulated and has branches all over the country, so it's better to register with them. Adventurers are treated like troublemakers, and it sounds quite unfortunate. Many Adventurer Guild members are unscrupulous. In reality, they not only cause trouble in the city, but also engage in criminal activities, raise the fees for their services, abandon clients during escort missions if they encounter a tough opponent, and in some cases, even kill their clients. So, be careful when taking on requests that are also accepted by Adventurer Guild members. Do not trust them under any circumstances. They would do anything for money but offer no guarantees. That's the Adventurer's Guild, I suppose. Now, let me explain about the truth crystals, magic paper, and radar. I was actually quite curious about those. Oh, by the way, how did you know I wanted to know about them? I heard it from Mel Tenners. She mentioned that you were curious about truth crystals, magic paper, and the radar. Is that so? By the way, who is this Mel Tenners you keep mentioning? She will be the goddess who will support you from now on. So please get along with her. If you can't connect with me through communication, contact her. I've added her to your friends list, so you can check it. I opened the friends list and immediately found Mel Tenner's name. There were only two names listed, you and the supposed goddess. Yes, I see it. Good. Now, let's move on to the explanation of the truth crystals. In simple terms, they are useful items that display a person's stats and work as lie detectors. They are widely used in various countries. When you place your hand on a crystal, it displays your stats. If you lie in response to a question, the crystal turns red. It's a handy item. Just be careful not to break it, as you'll have to pay a hefty price to replace it if you do. I understand. I don't know your values, but it's worth about three houses. So, be very careful not to break it. Got it. Now, about magic paper. It's originally used to create spell books by binding multiple sheets together. While magic paper can be used individually by inscribing magic circles and infusing it with mana, its power is inferior to incantations, and it burns out after a single use. Plus, it's quite expensive, so it's not widely used. Magical stones which allow multiple uses, are more popular if it's expensive and can only be used once. It doesn't seem worth it. Let me clarify something about teleportation magic since it might have been a misunderstanding. Teleportation magic isn't as versatile as you might think. Not versatile? So, it won't activate unless certain conditions are met? That's right. Teleportation magic won't activate without following specific steps. First, you need to create a magic circle at your destination and one at your current location. Then, you have to stand on the magic circle at your destination, infuse it with mana, and wait for approximately 15 to 20 seconds. In the case of magic paper, you must hold it while infusing mana, and you mustn't move. If you step out of the magic circle, the teleportation magic will be cancelled and you'll have to start over. 
The same applies to magic paper. So, teleportation magic doesn't work instantly like in games. That's why you summoned monsters and stalled for time earlier. I assume. I wonder where those magic circles led, too, though. Now, about the radar. The radar is a valuable item that can locate people and monsters within a certain range. However, it's not perfect and has limitations. It can't locate those with the concealment skill or monsters with high mana control, so keep that in mind. Thank you for explaining all this. Now, finally, let me explain the special announcement. This is the main reason I contacted you today. Special announcement? What is it? The hero is about to arrive on this continent. In order to lead the world to peace, I need you to guide him. He is already on this continent and is currently heading towards the capital. His name is Oliver, and he has a calm and gentle personality. He is the hope of the world, so please support him. The hero, Oliver. So, he's coming to this continent. Understood. I'll support him to the best of my ability. Thank you. And one more thing. You must never let the hero, Oliver, learn about the existence of the general god. This is a top secret mission. If Oliver learns about me, the world's future will be in danger. Do you understand? Yes, I understand. I won't let him find out. Good. If you have any questions or need assistance, feel free to contact me or Maltenas. Goodbye for now. The god's face disappeared from the screen. I'm worried about the hero, Oliver, but I don't have much information about him. I'll have to gather more information and plan my actions accordingly. I sat down on the bed and began to think about my next steps. 23, Chapter 11 At the same moment, under the moonlight in the middle of the night, adventurers of debt are gathered around a campfire in the forest, taking a break or taking turns tending to the firewood. However, among these adventurers, five were wounded. Why were these five adventurers wounded? Their injuries couldn't be fully healed by the effects of potions, so they had resorted to using scraps of cloth as makeshift bandages. While this stopped the bleeding, the pain still persisted, and they groaned in agony, battered and bruised. One of them seemed to have had enough and suddenly stood up, raising his voice. Oh, enough already. You guys are so damn noisy. Your groaning is keeping me awake. Shut up already. Upon hearing these words, one of the wounded men stood up, adopting a confrontational stance. What did you say, you little punk? Despite being a lowlife, do you even understand what you're saying to me, huh? The reactions of the onlookers varied as they observed the commotion. Some who were keeping watch turned their heads, while those who had been sleeping roused themselves to watch. A few, however, seemed to want no part in the conflict and turned their backs, seemingly uninterested. Ignoring the reactions of those around them, the two continued to escalate the tension. A low life, ha huh? ha, huh. don't make me laugh, let's see who would win between me, who's uninjured, and you, burdened with those wounds, and when it comes to comparing you to that hooded woman with her mysterious weapon, you're not even remotely scary, the low life adventurer taunted smirking as he drew his sword, anticipating a victory. It seems like you want me to kill you. The other wounded man, his face twisted in anger, prepared his spear. He seemed genuinely intent on taking a life. His hostility palpable. Stop it, you two. This is not the time for this, exclaimed a man wearing mithril armor. He was Shirai, the former deputy guild leader of Deta. Listen, everyone, we can't afford to fight amongst ourselves right now. We've been chased out of the country, and if we cause trouble here, soldiers might come looking for us. Besides, we promised to stick together until we reached the border. Upon hearing his words, the two combatants reluctantly lowered their weapons. Meanwhile, the adventurer who had been tending to the campfire slammed a piece of firewood onto the ground before standing up. Damn it, I can't take it anymore. I'm leaving right now. Wait, Beth. Calm down, Beth. The man named, turned to Sheree with an angry expression and began to speak. What's this about calming down? Look at what you've gotten us into. This job was supposed to bring in a fortune, but it's been a disaster from the start. Our plan was exposed. We got outnumbered and attacked, and that white-haired woman killed our comrades. When we tried to return to Gozes, we almost got caught to top it off. 
We've used up all our potions and can't heal our wounds. What's the plan now? How are you taking responsibility for this mess? Upon hearing Beth's words, the other adventurers turned hostile, approaching him with anger. What? Beth, you remember what you said before we left? You were all excited, saying that once we got our hands on the treasure, you'd buy the best weapons and armor and spend your time with prostitutes. You were all full of yourself, weren't you? Did you forget already? And you said something like, if there are three women, it's like a dream come true. You even promised to enjoy yourself to the fullest as long as we didn't interfere. Remember telling us not to mess with you? Seeing that things were turning against Beth, he stepped back and then spoke with great effort. Wait, guys, didn't you think this could happen to you? Don't you find it strange that we're being pursued like this? Maybe Data's boss, our big brother, had some hidden agenda when he gave us this job. What do you say, deputy guild leader? As Beth looked at Shirai while asking this, the other adventurers also turned their eyes to Shirai. I, I don't know all the details but, but what? A few days ago, I happened to see the guild leader talking with Grubert in the guild. It seemed suspicious to me, so I hid and eavesdropped. They were talking like this, if we don't eliminate him this time, we're done for. And, I had a feeling about it because they were also discussing the job with that strained hooded woman. When I tried to ask the guild leader for more details, he told me to stop blabbering and just do the job. He said we'd make a fortune, and the reasons didn't matter. Then he ran off. I've been suspicious of this job from the start. Having heard this, the other adventurers looked perplexed, but Beth was different. You see, Detta used us for something and this lousy job wasn't worth it. So, I'm out of here. Goodbye. Beth turned to leave without looking back, and Sheree and the others could only watch until he disappeared into the forest. Looks like Beth really left. Deputy guild leader, was what you said true? One of the adventurers asked Sheree, who began to explain honestly. Yeah, I didn't tell Beth, but the guild leader started acting strangely about four days ago and he was getting increasingly agitated until today. He even threatened us, saying we had to make this job a success or he'd kill all of us. What do you think about this? Shirai asked, seeking their opinions. When the guild leader gets that worked up, it's usually when a job that could bring in a lot of money goes wrong, right? It's strange for him to get so worked up before the job even starts. Is that what you think too? Yeah, I think we might have been set up by Detta. And by the way, those two who went on patrol, aren't they taking too long? Come to think of it, you're right, it's way past their shift change, and they haven't returned. Maybe something happened to them? The remnants of Data had been taking turns patrolling, and two of them hadn't returned even though it was well past their scheduled shift change. Well, that's enough of this. Kazl and Lado, you guys were up next for patrol, right? While you're out patrolling. See if you can find those two. When the deputy guild leader said this, the two of them agreed and began to prepare their weapons. There's no need for that. Lock spear. With those words, spears made of stone suddenly pierced the heads of the two adventurers, and they fell to the ground like cut puppets. Whoa, who did that? The deputy guild leader turned to face the direction from which the attack had come, and a hooded figure emerged from the darkness of the night. With a different demeanor than before. The figure extended their palms in front of their face and began speaking to the deputy guild leader. Oh, it's you, deputy guild leader Shirai. Long time no see, I hope you're doing well. The figure's voice was calm and cold, devoid of the previous excitement. Their cloak rustled in the wind, revealing a hint of their mysterious weapon, which gleamed faintly in the moonlight. Shirai took a step back, his face turning pale. You, you're that hooded woman who attacked us. What do you want? The hooded woman took a step closer and continued speaking with a mocking tone. What do I want? Why, I'm here to finish what I started. You see, there's something I need from you, Deputy Guild Leader Shirai. As the situation escalated, the remaining adventurers readied their weapons, realizing that they were in grave danger. The forest was now filled with tension and uncertainty as they faced this enigmatic hooded figure once again. 22 Volume 2 Prologue, two weeks after the incident in Gozes, I, Nelson D. Baldeck, 
the Duke of Baldeck, was organizing the documents related to that incident. No issues with the documents, just need to stamp them. I took the seal and carefully applied ink to it to ensure it would leave a clear mark on the paper. Then, I began pressing the inked seal onto each document. Phew, this should wrap up the work for this case. After stamping the last batch of documents, I double checked to ensure no documents were missed in the process. Once I confirmed everything was in order, I stacked the documents neatly and placed them next to another pile on the desk. My brother mentioned that he would continue the investigation on the national level regarding this incident. He's probably as busy as I am these days. After arresting Grubert, I returned to the capital to write the report after confirming that the Gozes branch of the Comprehensive Guild had no issues. In the past two weeks, the trial for the three main culprits who were apprehended in Gozes had also concluded. Gruber should have been sentenced to death for the crime of illegal slave trading, as mandated by international law established in intercontinental agreements. However, in light of his cooperation with the investigation into this incident and his straightforward confession, his punishment was commuted to the revocation of his title confiscation of his assets, and exile from the Leverant continent. During the trial, Grubert himself had implored the judge to sentence him to death, given the gravity of his crimes. However, the judge had advised him, if you truly feel remorse for your actions, then remember that remorse and lead an honest life from now on, not for your sake, but for someone else's. Grubert had knelt on the spot, shedding tears of gratitude upon hearing this advice. The second individual, Razvs Brumer, the former chairman of the Brumer Slave Trading Company, who had engaged in illegal slave trading alongside Grubert, was sentenced to death for his crimes. He protested, wondering why he was sentenced to death when Grubert, who was exiled from the continent, was not. He had planned to appeal, but he couldn't afford the appeal fees. The money Razvs Brumer had earned through his illicit activities had been seized by the state and he had very little money left from his legitimate business. As for the third individual, former adventurer guildmaster debtor, he had attempted to assassinate the chairman of the Leverant Comprehensive Guild and the former Lord of Gozes. In addition to various other crimes committed in the city, he had been convicted of these crimes and sentenced to labor in a dangerous mine alongside his subordinates who had remained loyal to him. However, a problem had arisen. It was unexpected that the remaining members of Detta's gang were found dead in the forest. According to our soldiers' records, they were killed by bandits. But, I wondered if that was really the case. Would Elena, who had seen similar events with the soldiers of the Reedgum, say the same? Maybe I should talk to Eleni about this. I remembered that when we parted ways, Gul had invited her to join the Second Night Order. But she had declined, saying, Thank you for the invitation. But for now, I want to live freely, however, I plan to come to the capital once I've saved up some money, so please rest assured she had said something like that. Freedom, she probably prefers adventuring to becoming a knight. <clears throat> All right, I took a blank piece of paper from the drawer and started writing with a pen. I decided to send a letter through the Gozes branch of the Comprehensive Guild to ask Eleanor for her perspective on the deaths of Detta's gang. She might provide a different view from the soldiers and offer a unique insight. Once I finished writing the letter, I rang the bell on my desk to summon a servant. After a brief wait, I heard a knock at the door. Come in. The door opened, and Murdin, the butler, entered the room. Do you need something, Lord Nelson? I've written a letter for Eleanor in Gozes. Please arrange for it to be delivered through the Gozes branch of the Comprehensive Guild. Gozes? Just a while ago, we received a letter from the Comprehensive Guild's branch in Gozes address to you. What? Has something else happened? I haven't read the contents of the letter, but I don't believe it's an urgent matter. Unlike the previous letter, this one is neatly written not hastily scribbled. I see. I received the letter that Murden handed me and opened it to check its contents. Oh. So, Eleanor is coming to the capital? That's great. I should inform Gull and the others. They'll be delighted. Shall I cancel the letter to Gozes then, and instead inform Lord Honda that Eleanor Sama is heading to the capital? Yes, please do that, Murden. Very well. Murden left the room after saying, Excuse me. Now, when Eleanor arrives, 
I should inquire about the remnants of debtor's gang before expressing my gratitude. Also, my wife mentioned that she wants to meet Helena. I should arrange for them to meet. But, is it safe for my wife? Knock, knock. Come in. Excuse me. Huh? Murdin. He had just left a moment ago, hadn't he? Did he delegate my request to another servant? But he's known for his meticulous nature, so he wouldn't do such a thing, right? What's the matter? Just a while ago, Lady Amy Ristert of the Second Night Order came here and informed us that Lady Eleanor has arrived in the capital. Is that so? Eleanor has already arrived? Wait a minute. Isn't that quite fast? Didn't this letter just arrive recently? I looked at my pocket watch to check the current time. It's 9.30. If she came by shared carriage, it should have taken a bit more time. Did she borrow a horse from the stable? Borrowing a horse is more expensive than sharing a carriage, but it would allow for a fast journey. Come to think of it, when we parted ways, she mentioned that she couldn't ride a horse. She said, I can't ride a horse, so I'll have to walk for hours. I remember her saying that with a wry smile. So how did she manage to cover the four-hour journey from Gozes to the capital on foot? Did Eleanor lie about not being able to ride a horse? I concluded that she must have. If she arrived without any issues, then I shouldn't dwell on how she made the journey. Well, once I've had some tea, I should prepare to welcome her. Nelson leaned back in his chair, gazing at the garden through the window as he waited for his tea. 19. Chapter 1 Good morning. I arrived at the Comprehensive Guild early in the morning today and greeted the staff. Good morning, Ellie. Good morning. You're here again today. It's been two weeks since the Gruber incident, and I've learned quite a bit about this world. Thanks to the guidance of Goddess Miltina, I've learned how to wash my hair and body properly, as well as how to wear underwear and some manners for girls. Well, I don't pay too much attention to manners, though. Also, the position of Lord of Gozes has been decided for a relative of Langut. Why did it end up being a relative of Langut? You ask. Well, there were three other candidates for the Lordship of Gozes, but they all had issues. They were in debt, were spendthrifts, lacked popularity, and there were rumors questioning if they could be trusted with the important trading post of Gozes. As a result, they were disqualified from the Lordship candidacy. They protested. Of course, but there was no turning back, and the king, after hearing these negative rumors, ordered soldiers to investigate their homes. Two of them were arrested, and the remaining one had his title revoked due to various charges, making it a rather unfortunate outcome. And now, the issue I'm currently facing is this, good morning, Ellie. Hey, everyone, our savior, Ellie, is here today. Ellie, good morning. You look beautiful as always, Ellie. How about some tea with me? I know a great place. What are you doing? Ellie, let's go on a date. Please. Kai uh, Big Sis Ellie is right in front of me. Big Sis, would you go on a quest with me? I rely on you. Um, I, uh, Ellie. I'm your fan. Ellie, can I shake your hand? Ellie Chan, please come to Mayan. I'll give you special service. I love you. Marry me. Big Sis. I miss the nights. Will you share a bed with me? With your beautiful feet. Please trample on me. Call me a worthless pig. Towards the end. There are some strange requests, but it seems I've gained some fans. How did this happen? You ask. Well, after the Gruber incident, I was hailed as a hero who saved the town by the Comprehensive Guild and the citizens. People who were present even started a fan club for me, so I ended up with a few fans though they are a minority. When I consulted with the goddess about what to do, she said I should just be myself because everyone likes me the way I am. She even said, you'll gain more fans if you do things like that, right? So, about five days ago, some merchants set their eyes on my weapon and asked me to sell it. They were willing to pay any price. I explained why I couldn't sell it, but they weren't convinced. In the end, they foolishly ordered their three guards to capture me and take my weapon. However, I defeated them in a brawl. Soon after, soldiers arrived and escorted them to jail. This would have been a normal story. But it seems that the goddess, in front of the entire town, said, there's nothing to sell to someone like that who does such things. So, that's how this situation came about. She said that if she hadn't said that one word, it wouldn't have come to this. And, as I heard yesterday, 
that merchant had apparently done similar things elsewhere, stealing from people, and was arrested for theft. Sigh. I guess I should greet these people at least. You um, good morning, everyone. Surprisingly, the fans who were just arguing a moment ago stopped and lined up neatly, then lowered their heads when they saw me. Good morning, Ellie. Good morning, Ellie. Thank you, Ellie. Have a great day. It's cute how you get all shy. The comprehensive guild staff thanked me one by one. Ah, thank you all. Um, oh no, my face is getting hot. Don't be embarrassed, just go. Why yes, I'll, um, be going. I said that while placing my hand on my spinning head, then left the comprehensive guild. Balboz's side. That guy is so bashful. Can't he do something about it? Thinking about Ellie who left the comprehensive guild with an uncertain step, I felt like laughing, but I held back to maintain my dignity. Guild master, it depends on her personality. Besides, that gap between her real self and her bashful side is part of the reason why she's so popular. Gali, what's up? Gali approached me and asked while I was reminiscing about Ellie, could you look over these documents for me? Sure. I'll read them later. I took the documents that Gali offered. Also, there's something I'd like to ask you. What is it? Ellie is going to the capital soon, so I came to say goodbye. Eh, what? That's right, she's heading to the capital now. So, are the promotion exams going to be held at the capital? In the past two weeks, I had taken on quests and earned quest points to be eligible for promotion to rank D according to the comprehensive guild staff. I accumulated points quickly. Yes, that's the plan. I also intend to meet with Chairman Baldeck. All right, I understand. I'll inform the Capital's Comprehensive Guild about the promotion exams in a letter. And since she's planning to meet Chairman Baldeck without prior notice, I'll write a letter to him as well. It'll be faster if we split the tasks. Understood. Also, it seems like there's going to be a problem. Huh? What are you talking about, Guildmaster? Please have a look at that. I followed Gali's pointing finger and saw that some of Ellie's fans were standing there in a daze. Ah, I see. It's probably because they were shocked when they heard she's going to the capital. Guildmaster. Should we wake them up? Leave them. It'll be quieter this way. Now, let's get back to work. All right. I told Gali that, then returned to my own workplace. However, about 15 minutes later, the fans started making a fuss again calling Ellie's name, and we had to intervene to calm them down. Uck, damn it. This is all because of Ellie. Remember this for next time she comes. Hearing my words, Gali chuckled, and it seemed like we'd have to deal with this issue for a while. 21. Chapter 2. As I walked through the city after leaving the Adventurers Guild, I received expressions of thanks and farewell greetings from the city's residents. I don't know where they got the information. But there were even some people at the gate, along with the gatekeeper, who came to see me off. To be honest, I felt embarrassed until I left the city. Oh, um, it was embarrassing. Well, now that I've left the city, there shouldn't be anyone around. I stopped walking on the road leading to the capital and checked my menu. I looked at the vehicles in my storage. Since walking to the capital will take a long time and be tiring, I should use a vehicle. Which one should I choose? My options were. A motorcycle or a car. I decided on the latter. It's better to be safe even if there's an attack. Let's go with the car. I summoned the Humvee M1151. Yeah. It's always impressive. This is a military vehicle. Wait. What's this? I was astonished when I saw the weapons mounted on the vehicle. There's no one else who could have done this but that guy. I said while trying to establish communication with God, but no matter how many times I tried, there was no response. It's not connecting. Well then, I immediately contacted Melvinas. Hello, Eleanor San. Calling this early in the morning, did something happen? Yes. Actually, God has done it again. Again? Does that person never learn? That's right. God had been accessing my menu, my armory, and equipment shelves without permission, customizing my weapons and vehicles for fun. I once questioned why God could access my menu, and he replied, I made it so I could access the menu before I gave you that power. I won't do anything strange, of course, but that God had already done plenty of strange things, I want them to revert the customization. I've asked them. 
but they, uck, there's no point in getting angry now, but why do I have this? I don't remember obtaining this super air weapon. Come to think of it, a while ago, God was smiling and said, I got something nice. I want to show it to Eleanor Chan, you'll definitely be happy. Is this it? Absolutely. I didn't have this. I really wanted it. Because the Core 19 b 12.7 by 99 variant, mounted on the Humvee M1151 could only be obtained through Gakka, it was considered an ultra-rare weapon, with only about 15 people in the game I used to play having it. How did God get it? I wanted it too, but I never won it in the Gakka. It's probably that God copied something that already existed and put it in your armory. If that were true, it would be quite problematic. What if the administrators find out? Will they freeze the account forcibly? Please rest assured about that. In your case, you're not logging into the game world of this world. In other words, you've incorporated the game data you were playing in your previous life into your body. So, no matter how much modification you make, you won't get your account frozen for cheating. So, as long as I'm not logged into the game, it should be fine, right? However, this time, they really gave you something amazing. I think you could probably take on a hundred soldiers in this world with just this. No, no way. Even if I had three of these, I might understand the idea. Why is that? If I think about it in terms of normal tactics, it would be better to deploy left and right and attack with bows and magic while surrounding them. There are other ways too. Dealing with a large number of enemies was easy. But dealing with scattered enemies was difficult. Because I would have to aim the gun in various directions, it would leave me vulnerable. However, Meldimers started to chuckle. Huh? Did I say something strange? In this world, there are very few people who think like you. Besides, you understand the ranges of bows and magic, right? Well, the normal range for magic is about 15 meters, and depending on your skill, you can extend it. As for the bow in this world, it's about 80 meters, but in practice, you can accurately hit a target up to about 30 meters, right? Melvinas looked impressed and then began to share knowledge about this world. That's right. As I mentioned earlier, in this world, if soldiers were to come up with a strategy against you, they would probably gather their forces and charge. If a hundred doesn't work, try two hundred, with soldiers shooting arrows and using magic while charging. If that doesn't work either, just increase the numbers and charge again. Many people think like that in this world, what a ruthless way to fight, it's terrifying. That's why there are few people like warlords from the Three Kingdoms or the Sengoku period in this world, and sometimes, nobles who don't even know the word will become famous for commanding armies. Scary, isn't it? Wow, I feel like there was something similar on Earth. Oh well, never mind. More importantly, shouldn't I get on this before someone finds it? You're right, it would be a waste of time to stand here talking. Yeah, and I was told yesterday by God that the capital is livelier and has more traffic than goes is. So it's better to secure accommodations first. Thanks for telling me, of course, I'll speak to them about the unauthorized customization. By the way, Eleanor San, in this world, when riding on horses or carriages, you drive on the right side of the road, please keep that in mind. If you need anything else, feel free to contact me. Thank you very much, Melinas. I said that and hung up the communication. Then, I got into the driver's seat of the Humvee M1151 and started the engine. Now, let's go for the first drive. Wait, the Humvee is an automatic transmission. I didn't know that. I released the handbrake and gently pressed the accelerator, starting to move. It's comfortable. Should I speed up? Currently, I was driving at 50 km per hour on this open road with good visibility, and I couldn't see any obstacles. I thought about increasing the speed a bit, but, let's stop here, it's better to drive safely, and at this rate, we'll arrive in about 15 minutes. Huh? I saw another carriage up ahead, it seemed like there was an increase in traffic between the capital and Gozes over the past two weeks. Well, never mind, I'll overtake them. I said that and approached the carriage from behind. I signaled left, then lightly pressed the accelerator to increase speed and overtook the carriage from the left. Then, I eased off the accelerator, 
returning to 50 km per hour and putting some distance between me and the carriage. As I passed by, I noticed that the person driving the carriage was quite surprised. Well, I guess you'd make that face when you see something you've never seen before. Warning. Danger detected at 12 o'clock. Potential enemy. Thanks to the radar upgrade God gave me, the detection radius had increased from 200 meters to 500 meters. But why were there enemies so close to the road? Were we facing bandits or rogue adventurers again? I stopped the car by the side of the road and visually checked the area ahead. I couldn't identify them clearly, but I could see that there was something there, a bit away from the road. I took out my binoculars to get a better look. They're members of this country's night order, and they're... Oops. No way. There's no way we were informed about this. Four knights were fighting five orcs and it was clear that the knights were at a disadvantage. I recognized one of the knights. These people, let's consider this as paying back the favor. I said that and opened the menu to put away Ace-32 and switch to another gun. The Marksman Rifle SVU Ots 03, 7.62x54 MMR caliber. Of course, I didn't use the Gore 19B. There was a risk of completely annihilating the knights with it. I was ready now. I couldn't shoot the orcs here, so I needed to change my position to get a good angle. I started moving to help the knights. 25, Chapter 3, Tilda Second Knight Order Vice Commander Bage Adult and Tilda. Bager let out a roar and, wielding a one-handed axe, dodged the charging orc before using his dual swords and the skill twin strike to cut it down. But it didn't prove to be a fatal blow. What the hell? What's going on here? I didn't receive any reports about orcs being in this area. Baker had been conducting monster training with three of his subordinates from the Knight Order when he unexpectedly encountered orcs in this vicinity. These orcs were stronger than the usual ones. Moreover, there were still five of them. This could endanger his subordinates. I'll hold these guys back. So, the rest of you, go back to the capital and inform Commander Girl. We can't leave you behind, Vice Commander. You won't stand a chance against them. Please, just run. It's the only way. Even so, Vice Commander Bega, just go. Guar, turning to the source of the noise, Bega saw one of his subordinates, Aziz, bleeding from his left shoulder and kneeling as an orc raised a club to strike him. Suddenly, an arrow pierced the orc's eye. It seemed Myrina had shot it with her bow to save Aziz. Now's our chance, Bega. His face contorted in pain, sneaked into the orc's vicinity and crossed his dual swords. Warg. With a battle cry, Baker delivered a series of strikes to the orc and finished it off with a final kick to the chin. Die, you damn monster. The orc, wounded by Baker's attacks, sank to the ground from its back. Sorry, Vice Commander. As is, still on his knees with his hand on his bleeding shoulder, addressed Baker, but Baker kept his dual swords ready and spoke to Aziz. That's fine. Now go quickly to Lazrina to get healed. Yes, Aziz said this before rushing toward Lazrina. Four orcs remained. Huh? One of them was missing. Where could it have gone? Kyra turning toward the scream, Bega saw Myrina being held captive by an orc. Damn. While I was distracted by Aziz, Myrina got captured. As I tried to rush to Myrina's rescue, the orc holding her turned towards me. Human, if you move. I'll kill this woman. What? I halted my approach. To make matters worse, the orc had its hands around Myrina's neck and seemed ready to break it. Myrina, please. Help her, Ursula. Save her, Senior. Woof. Stop, Lazrina. If you do that, Myrina will be killed. I prevented Lazrina from using her summoned creature to rescue Myrina. The orcs can talk. They're not ordinary orcs after all. What should I do? This situation is getting worse. That's enough, keep her like that. Buihahi. The orc sneered at me with a maddening grin. No, don't hurt her. I watched in horror as the orc tightened its grip on Myrina's neck, preventing her from speaking any further. Enough, woman. Damn it, how can I, how can I save my subordinates? As I tried to think of a way to rescue them, one of the orcs behind me approached, wielding a rusty sword and ready to strike. Buihahi, die. Am I going to die here? Unable to save my subordinates, Kyra, amid Myrina's scream, a thunderous explosion echoed in my ears. What happened to Myrina? Huh? A. Uh, ah. For some unknown reason, 
Myrina and Aziz were surprised, while Lizrina seemed to notice something and the orc that was about to kill me had stopped, frozen in shock as if it had witnessed something unbelievable. Following the orc's gaze, I looked to see a hole in the head of the orc that had held Myrina hostage, it was dead. What? Who did this? Vice Commander. Get away from the orcs, Lizrina shouted at me, and I finally snapped out of my daze. I turned to chase the fleeing orc, but for some reason, at that moment, I couldn't move my body. No, that's not it. My body seemed to have refused to move. Tilda Eleanor's perspective Tilda. Oh, it got away. I muttered while looking through the scope attached to my SVU odds. Oh three, seven dot sixty two times fifty four RMM, rifle at the orc running pathetically four hundred meters away. I had no intention of letting it escape. Orc. You were unlucky. I aimed at the orc's right leg squeezed the trigger until the primer was about to drop, took a light breath, exhaled slightly, and then held my breath. Now, with that thought, I fully squeezed the trigger, the gunshot and the sound of the bullet piercing through the orc's right leg were almost simultaneous. The orc, with its right leg shot through, fell to the ground and tried to get up. However, I had already aimed my rifle at its head, prepared to finish it off. Last shot, I pulled the trigger, and the 7.62x54R remem round made its distinct sound. Almost simultaneously, the bullet blew off the orc's head, killing it. Phew. All right, there are no other enemies. After confirming that there were no other enemies, I switched to a fresh magazine for my SVU. Odds 03. Why didn't that person attack immediately after creating an opportunity by trying to save their comrade from the orcs? They seemed somewhat bewildered, but. Well, whatever, in the end, I ended up eliminating the orcs, so it worked out fine, Lizrina. I'll let this one slide, as I watched the night order through the scope of my SVU. Odds 03, I noticed that something was amiss. Huh? The night order's behavior seems odd. Besides Lizrina, they're starting to hold weapons and become cautious. R? Now they're arguing with someone who has swords in both hands. And Lizrina's summoned creature is involved too. Well, I guess I can't help it. I decided to walk toward the Night Order to stop the commotion. Let's stow this sandbag and put the Humvee in the garage later. I opened the menu, stowed the bag of sand that had been under the gun into my item box, and then put the Humvee 1151 in the garage. This was what they called tactical reloading. It's been a while since our reunion, but it's turned out like this. I can only sigh rather than feel joy. Ha. Huh. Elena walked while letting out deep sighs. 19. Chapter 4. I moment really stopped on my way towards the night order to observe the situation. I used binoculars to look at the knights 300 meters ahead, but it seemed like they still hadn't noticed me. In fact, they appeared to be engaged in a heated argument. Furthermore, as I advanced another 50 meters, Lizrina sat on the ground, crying, while her arguing companion scratched his head, wearing a puzzled expression. What's more, it seemed like the people around them were gathering by Lizrina's side and trying to talk to her. What are those people doing in a place like this? When I got within 200 meters, I called out Lizrina's name loudly towards them, and a person with a bow noticed my voice and turned towards me. Lucky. But wait, is it just my imagination, or is that person really aiming the bow at me? Caution. Danger detected at 12 o'clock, potential enemy. Hey, isn't that a bit too much? I'm the one who saved you all, and you're going to do this to me? I thought, but I guess it's only natural for them to act this way. After all, apart from Liz Lena, they don't know anything about me, and at this distance, they probably can't see me clearly. Oh. Right. If I get this close, I should be able to use the microphone function on my headset, right? I stopped walking, turned the knob on my headset, and decided to listen to the night order's conversation. Eek. El Chan must be here. I can only think of El Chan's attack. Sniff. Where can someone with such skills be? In fact, I can't see anyone at all. I'm sorry, but I'm right here. And your comrades are targeting me. Um, Vice Captain. There's someone approaching us. How should we handle it? What? Who is this person? How many are there? Oh. They finally noticed me. But wait. 
Did the person with the bow not mention me to them before aiming the arrow? I can't see clearly, but it's just one person. They don't seem to be carrying weapons, but they have something like a black stick. It's possible they're a thief posing as a civilian. A black stick, Murina. Is that person's hair white? Well, hold on, Lazrina. I don't have magical eyes like Keith, so I can't say for sure. Lazrina, please hurry up and identify me. I might get shot by the person they're talking to. Well, it's still out of range, though. Mew you you wait, both of you. Murina, are there really no others around? Is it just one person? Yes, I can't see anyone else. I think it's just one person. It does seem like just one person. Let's leave the orc for now and go meet them. Vice Captain, there might be danger. As is, I understand that. But if that person turns out to be Eleanor as Lazrina said, we'll be disrespecting girl's benefactor. Besides, we're knights, aren't we? We can't be scared by something like this. What if that person walking is really just a civilian? As Vice Captain says, We'll approach cautiously while keeping an eye on our surroundings. Keep your weapons holstered. If that person is a civilian, they might mistake us for bandits and run away. Let's all go meet them. As expected, Vice Captain is someone who can make decisive judgments. Roger. He he he. I can finally meet El Chan again. I'm looking forward to it. What nonsense are you talking about? It's not confirmed that it's Elrena, right? And what about your response? Ugh, I, ah, uh, forgot. Sorry, Vice Captain Baker. This guy, really? I'll have to tell Chief Girl about this. Well, Vice Captain Baker, you're so mean. Lazrina, my condolences. I'll pick up the pieces for you. After lowering the volume on my headset, I began walking towards the Night Order to meet Lazrina. El Cullen. Once Lazrina recognized me, she ran towards me, shouting my name and hugged me. Hey, hey, Liz, Lizrina, I understand that you're happy to see me, but did you really have to run like that? I mean, I'm right here. She was panting and sweating as she talked, and I couldn't quite understand what she was trying to convey. Wait, is Lizrina leaning on me? It feels like I'm supporting her. No, it's not my imagination. Woof. See, even Lizrina's summoned creature looked up at me with concern. I opened the menu bought a bottle of potion, and handed it to Lizrina with the cap removed. Here, Lizlina, have some potion. Hey, thank you, L. Chan. I don't really understand what she's saying, but Lizrina moved away from me to take the drink and started sipping it. At last, I caught up. Hey, Lizlina, what's the big idea running off like that? You're such a... While Lizrina was in the midst of her crucial moment. I decided to greet the two knights standing with swords in hand. Um, since we're not making any progress, let me introduce myself first. Nice to meet you all. I'm Eleanor from the Comprehensive Guild Adventure Division. <laughs> oh, right. Let's put off scolding this one for later. I'm Bega Dalton, a human, and I serve as the Vice Captain of the Second Knight Order of the Regarm Kingdom. I'm Aziz. As you can see, I'm a dwarf residing in the Night Order, and this is my pride and joy, my axe. The short guy proudly raised a long-handled axe. Come to think of it, dwarves have a tradition of cherishing their weapons as much as their lives, as the comprehensive guild staff mentioned. My name is Murina Libias, a beastkin, specifically a rabbit tribe. Liz Lena and I are from the same year, even though our ages are different. Oh, I see. Murina is Lizrina's classmate, could it be that your ears helped you hear us just now? Actually, there are no obstacles around, so my loud voice should have been audible even without the need for enhanced hearing. He he he, that's right. Earlier, I apologize for pointing the arrow at you. Lizrina's crying made it difficult to hear clearly. Ah, I see. My voice must have been muffled by Lizrina's crying. L. Chan, thank you. It was delicious. Lizrina showed an empty bottle while saying that, she drank it all, I'm glad you enjoyed it, Lizrina, but since we've finished greeting Vice Captain Baker and the others, let's get to the main point, huh, when did you finish greeting Vice Captain Baker and the others, just a moment ago, Lizrina, were you too busy drinking to hear anything I said, are, oh, I didn't hear that, she said with an expression of surprise, you, 
On the other hand, despite the frown on Vice Captain Baker's face, he decided to postpone scolding Lizrina for later. Well, um, can we discuss this after my conversation with you is finished? I asked. However, it seemed like Baker couldn't hear me as he continued to scold Lizrina while looking at her. Eleanor, when Vice Captain Baker gets like that, it's best to leave him alone. Is that so? I placed my hand on my waist and observed Baker, who was getting angry, and Lizrina, who was repeatedly apologizing on her knees. Yeah, it doesn't look like it's going to work. So, what did you want to talk about? We're fine with discussing it if it helps. Well, it doesn't matter since we're all part of the same night order, and I want to save time. Yes, I wanted to confirm something. When we left Gozus, we received a message from the Comprehensive Guild saying that orcs were appearing around here. Did you come here to investigate the orcs? The two exchanged glances before turning towards me. We came here for training. So, we haven't heard anything about orcs appearing. They replied. So even the Night Order hasn't heard about the orcs. So, does that mean we were the first ones to confirm the presence of orcs here? It seems so. Wait a minute. Melina looked at me with a concerned expression. <laughs> What's wrong? We also have something to confirm with you. If it won't take long, I'll listen. I wanted to collect the orc I defeated and head to the capital as soon as possible. All right. Just to confirm, you're the one who saved us from the orcs, right? Yes, that's correct. Melina averted her eyes and muttered something before turning back to me. I can't believe it was you who saved us. What kind of magic did you use? That loud noise. Does it have something to do with that magic? She thinks I defeated them with magic. In reality, I just sniped them with the SVU. It wasn't magic. Melina. El Chan used a black stick she has as a weapon to defeat the orcs. Tears welled up in Lizrina's eyes as she explained on my behalf. Wait, when did the scolding end? Huh? So, this is the weapon guild leader girl you was talking about? Yes. It looks different from what I saw, but it's the same thing, right, El Chan? Yes, that's right. But this time, I used a different gun because we were shooting from a distance. I wanted to explain in more detail, but time was short, so I kept it simple. Vice Captain Baker stepped forward and looked at me with a dignified expression. Eleanor, thank you for saving us. It's because of you that both my subordinates and I are still alive. I apologize for this late gratitude. And no, you don't need to thank me. My face. My face is getting hot. Why? No, this is not as vice captain, but my personal gratitude. You, 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 you. I felt overwhelmed by embarrassment and sat down like a little girl, clutching my face with my hands and writhing from side to side. Elena, what's wrong? Vice Captain Baker. Please stop her, Rizlina. What happened to her? Earl Chan is extremely shy. It's because of Vice Captain Baker's words of thanks. Didn't you mention that? Rizlina said with a frustrated look, addressing the Vice Captain. Hey, and, we need to report this incident to the Guild. We must. All right. I couldn't put my thoughts into words. I shook my head and tried to change my mindset. Oh. Let's retrieve that hook and head to the capital. What about the horses? We didn't bring them as part of our training. <laughs> I guess we have no choice. I'll use Humvee. I brought up the menu and summoned Humvee M1151. Then got on it. For now, let's head to the capital with this. Vice Captain, please get on as well. When Vice Captain Baker and the others looked at Humvee, they froze in surprise. Well, it's not that unusual even if it's like this. W what is this? It's a vehicle. Please get on quickly. And please keep this vehicle a secret. Absolutely. I understand. But can this vehicle move without horses? It's perfectly fine. Really? Yes. Is it safe? Yes. Geez. This vice captain doesn't listen. Vice Captain Baker. Let's do as El Chan says. We need to hurry, or the orcs El Chan defeated might get eaten by wolves. Well done. Lizrina, huh? That's true. Vice Captain Baker, who seemed like he wanted to say something, and as is, who was acting like a child and enjoying the situation, sat in the back seats. Melina, for some reason, sat in the gunner's seat and started looking around. And Lizrina sat in the passenger seat, looking at me expectantly. Everyone's on board. Let's go then. After saying that, 
I started the engine and drove home the M1151 forward, 22, Chapter 5. Next, after retrieving the body of the orc that hadn't been eaten by the wolves and storing it in my storage, we were heading towards the capital on the hum V M1151. Hey, Eleanor. Th this thing is working, right? It's really working, isn't it? It won't break, will it? Please, tell me, I asked, gazing anxiously in the rearview mirror at Bega San, who was clutching Aziz San's neck and making pitiful sounds. Um, Bega San, Aziz seems to be in pain, so could you please let him go? He might die. Are you guys not scared riding this weird thing? This guy just doesn't seem to hear a word I'm saying. Well, I'm having fun riding it, Murina said casually to Bega San. I trust El Chan, so I'm not scared, Lazreen replied with a smirk. I felt like there was some resentment in her tone. Was it just my imagination? B Bega, V V V V I, S C Commander. P please. Let G G G G G go. It H H hurts. As is San, his face turning blue, managed to mutter, but it seemed like Bega San couldn't hear him as he showed no signs of loosening his grip on Aziz's neck. Bega San, you are the vice commander, right? Pull yourself together. Yes, everyone, will be arriving in the capital soon, so please prepare to disembark. Initially, Murina had been hanging out of the gun seat with her body outside, but after seeing Bega San clutching Aziz San and not letting go, she was trying her best to peel them apart, but the moment she heard me speak, she stopped trying to separate them and turned her face toward me. Wow, it's so fast to get to the capital on this thing. No, no, Murina, don't stop what you're doing. We need to help Aziz San as soon as possible. El Chan, you're full of mysteries, aren't you? Are there any more? It's a secret, or, come on, El Chan. Just a little bit? Nope. If you try to find out, I won't give you the drink from earlier. You're mean, El Chan, you're being mean to me. Wah. Oh no. Lazrina started crying. Did I go too far? While thinking about that, I decelerated the hum V M1151 and parked it behind the last carriage waiting for immigration procedures rather than staying in line with the carriages. Walking to the gate would probably be faster than waiting in line with the carriages. From here, let's get off the vehicle and walk to the gate. Pull this lever, and the door will open. I explained how to open the door to Begas and the others before disembarking first. All right. That was fun. We'll ask you again if we have a chance. Lazrina and Murina got off without any issues, but the other two didn't move. WW we stopped? We stopped. Eleanor? What's happening? Yum. We've arrived, Bega San. Bega San was about to turn around and look at his surroundings, but his gaze stopped, and then his surprised expression turned to one of fear. As is, as is, get yourself together. Bega San had a blue face and foam was coming out of his mouth, as he tried to shake Aziz San awake, but Aziz didn't regain consciousness and only moved his head like a doll. Damn. Why is this happening? Huh. Could it be that the orc's weapon was poisoned? Bega San turned Aziz San to the side inside the vehicle and started rummaging through his backpack. What is he doing? Is he crazy? It's not. Damn it. Murina. I remember you had an antidote. Give it to me. Bega San stopped and looked at all of us with a suspicious glance. What? What are you guys doing? Um, Bega San, it seems like Aziz San is not suffering from poison. What? Then why is Aziz like this? Bega San asked me with a surprised expression. It seems like he doesn't realize it himself. Everyone present pointed at me and said, because you were strangling him. What? After that, the culprit, Bega San, hurriedly began performing CPR on Aziz San, who had regained consciousness thanks to the resuscitation efforts. I, I thought I was going to die. Aziz San, who had regained consciousness, spoke with a pouty face. I'm sorry, Aziz. Bega San apologized sincerely. I couldn't enjoy Eleanor's ride. I'm really sorry. Vice Commander Bega's attempted murder, huh? With three witnesses. You might not just be demoted but could even resign from the knighthood, Lizlina said with a smile, and it seemed like she was taking out her frustration from earlier. I'm so sorry. You can punch me if it makes you feel better. Bega San began bowing and apologizing to Aziz San, 
It was clear he had lost all his dignity as vice commander. Yes, everyone will be arriving at the capital soon. So please get ready to disembark. Understood. By the way, Amy, why did you come here with 20 knights? Wasn't the patrol scheduled for tomorrow? Amy-san had a troubled look on her face as she placed her hand on her cheek and answered Baker. Well, you see, we received information that something like an unknown monster appeared here and is heading toward the capital. Unknown monster? I hadn't seen anything like that before I came here. Is that about the orc I mentioned earlier? No, it's different. So, what kind of monster is it? Can you provide some information? Well, the information is limited because it was an urgent message. It said the entire body was covered in metal and that it was running incredibly fast along the road. According to some reports, it looked like there might be a person inside it, so it might be some sort of vehicle. It could be dangerous. So we're going to check it out. Baker, would you like to come with us? All right. I'll go with you, Amy. Lizrina and the others can report the orc to Captain Gwell. Got it. Wait, is that monster, by any chance? You are, Amy san. What is it? Elena Chan, could that monster possibly be this? I pointed at the Humvee M1151, asking Amy san for confirmation. Huh? Oh, Amy san looked at the Humvee M1151 and then suddenly grabbed my shoulders. It's exactly like the information said. Elena Chan. Why is this here? Oh no. Amy San's face is too close. And she's scaring me. Plus, she's gripping my shoulders so hard. It hurts. Doubly well, you see. Um. It's. Ah. Uh, tell me the truth. Elena Chan. Um. Yeah. I should just be honest. After all, lying. To Amy San wouldn't end well. Th. This is. Um. My possession. Elena Chan. Let's have a serious talk later. Alright? Uh-oh. I should have held back a bit more. I'm regretting it now. 13. 